Hello, everyone. The meeting is starting. Please sit down. We will begin this meeting. Thank you. And we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone can please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's wonderful to see this room filled. Can we get um, Trustee Roll Call, please? Here. 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 Thank you so much. Okay, we will now move on to consider non-personnel block vote items indicated in section three and four. Move approval of the items. Thank you. Second. Moved by Trustee Brown and second by Trustee uh, Dunchy. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Moving on to consider personnel block vote items indicated in section five. Do we have a motion? I'll, I'll move approval. Thank you. Moved by Trustee Dunchy. Second. Thank you. Second by Trustee Lopez. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we now move into Chancellor's report. Thank you and good evening, uh, Board President Rosales. Uh, so for my report this evening, we're going to have two uh, presentations. Uh, the first is going to be uh, the state of NOCE, and I'm going to invite uh, President Bertel to come on up and get her team ready. And then the second portion of the, the Chancellor's report uh, is going to be our recognition of the Orange County uh, Teacher of the Year. Uh, nominations and recommendations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to President Patel for the, the State of NOCE address. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All dear trustees, district colleagues, and NOCE team, it is my honor to present to you the annual report for North Orange Continuing Education. As you know, this was a very special year for NOCE as we celebrated 50 years of education and community impact. We began the year with a very special opening day, cheers for 50 years. We were joined by our faculty and staff, community partners, and uh, many dignitary guests. Among them was um, an Anaheim City Council member and a 48-year NOCE instructor, Stephen Fassel. Wow. Um, so he shared a few words with, uh, of wisdom with us, and then we also heard a virtual greeting from the three of our four former provosts, and they're featured right here on this slide. Dr. Gary McGuire, uh, Christine Terry, and Dr. Greg Schultz. And now I invite you to view a few highlights of this memorable year for NOCE. I will just wait a second. And while we are waiting, um, just so you can see our annual report is in front of you and the slides of course are in front of you as well as our institutional effectiveness report. 
we have changed the format of our IER. And you know, before we used to publish a 100-page book, and now we switch to um, Tableau dashboards because we find them much more usable and interactive. And so we refer to our IER report in um, various institutional committees and meetings and departmental planning. Thank you. I'm sure it'll be worth the wait. Thank you, Yulia.
thank you. Hopefully it was worth the wait. And Yulia, thank you so much for helping us. Well, as you could see, um, this year was marked with several historical milestones and achievements. In general, NOCE strives to live by its mission and vision, and we use our core institutional values to guide us in everyday decisions and um, in decision-making, planning, strategic planning, and operations. And our core institutional values include innovation, excellence, um, learning, accountability, equity, and diversity. Um, so these are some of the highlights of this year's milestones. Um, and OCE received a full six-year accreditation, and that was three times in a row with no warnings or review. And also, our NOCE's pharmacy technician program renewed its national accreditation, uh, again passed with uh, flying colors. We co-hosted um, the first uh, of its kind, Vision 2030, a call to action summit, um, and we co-hosted it in, uh, with the state chancellor, uh, Dr. Christian, Sonia Christian, and also San Diego College of Continuing Education. And we continue, we have led and we continue to lead throughout this year the Vision 2030 non-credit work group. And that's at the request of Chancellor Christian. And the work group is tasked with developing um, guidance for implementing Vision 2030 uh, for non-credit uh, practitioners, as well as the success metrics for non-credit programs specifically aligned with Vision 2030. And we are getting ready to publish um, our recommendations in the next months or so. We also launched Community College Technical Assistance Provider, or CCTAP initiative, and that's after receiving a 1.8 million grant from the State Chancellor's Office. So essentially, NOCE became the technical assistance provider and a provider of training and professional development for all 116 colleges offering non-credit programs. We institutionalized um, an OCE student trustee position, thank you, and we adopted an NOCE mascot mm -hmm. and added an OCE signage to the Anaheim campus. An OCE's excellence and community impact and innovation was recognized by many statewide leaders and policymakers, specifically the Honorable Lou Correa, Congress member Lou Correa, acknowledged NOCE on the House floor in Washington, D.C. That was very memorable. And Assemblywoman Sharon Fork Silva attended and congratulated NOCE at the VTIC conference, our annual conference. And then she also toured our NOCE Career Center and CTE programs. Department of Rehabilitation awarded our NOCE's DSS program with a five-year innovation grant focusing on integrated uh, training uh, for employment of adults with disabilities. And recently, the State Chancellor's Office selected NOCE as one of three early adopters of one of the demonstration projects for Vision 2030, specifically partnership with United Domestic Workers Union. And in fact, next week, we are getting ready to welcome our first cohort. We celebrate diversity of our community by continuously expanding the network of our community partners. Specifically last year, our team engaged more than 75 community partners and reached out to 3,500 families. Specifically, we sponsored Council on Aging annual gala and annual pickleball tournament. We also offered several power-up events. These events uh, were intended for our new and continuing students uh, where various community resources and services were brought to them and power-up events had been held at Anaheim and Cypress campuses, reaching more than 1,000 students. And we reconvened our annual partners breakfast where we engaged more than 50 community partners. That was um, very memorable. And our emeritus program added 21 more new locations um, throughout our service year, mostly um, senior uh, centers and community centers where we now offer um, emeritus classes. And we were really excited to partner with district services to celebrate classified appreciation lunch 
and we are getting ready to do the same this year. Uh, with the intention of providing equitable access to NOCD's programs and services, we have changed a bit how we do outreach last year. Uh, specifically, we embedded outreach uh, coordinators or contacts in each of the departments with the overall coordination and integration coming from um, our Office of Campus Communications. And as a result, we were able to provide targeted um, outreach activities and events for specific at-risk populations, and they're listed right here. Of course, we are an institution of learning, so our faculty had been very busy developing new courses, revising existing courses and programs, and developing new programs. As you can see, we launched 17 new programs, and among them was uh, two new IT programs. One of them is a pre-apprenticeship program that had become very popular and now has wait lists. And uh, like I said, our pharmacy technician program renewed its accreditation. And we have expanded the IBEST model where we embed ESL instruction and CTE classes to two more certificates. And um, BSS program launched integrated employment training having received a special grant from the Department of Rehabilitation. With the idea of providing holistic support for the whole student, our student services division launched several new um, services. Specifically, they established a student technology support uh, center that now includes our laptop program. And uh, they also focused on the strategies to increase the sense of belonging. Specifically, we opened a pride sp space for NOCE's LGBTQ plus community. And we launched the Rising Scholars program um, that focuses on formerly incarcerated and justice impacted adults. Uh, we have also uh, embedded educational coaching specifically um, in our CTE and BSS classes. And we have expanded partnership with Canine Companions Agency. So now we have two dogs in training and one of them um, specializes in assisting our neurodiverse students in the Arise Lab at Anaheim. So all these efforts led to, of course, student success. And we are very proud of our students. Specifically, NOCE awarded 184 high school diplomas last year, which was an increase. And we also saw an increase in BSS certificates, 249. Uh, our career technical education certificates increased by 45. So we awarded 298 last year and 901 ESL certificates which was an increase of 600 certificates in comparison to past year. And I know that Dulce is going to dive deeper into our enrollment recovery efforts, but I just wanted to share with you uh, what our enrollment recovery and growth trajectory looks like. As you can see that starting 21-22, we have seen a steady increase in enrollment. However, there's still work that needs to be done for us to be at the pre-pandemic level. Another very important indicator of institutional effectiveness and success for us is attainment of living wage uh, by our students. Um, so cohorts of students completing NOCE programs are tracked for attainment of Orange County uh, living wage. And as you can see, we have seen an increase in that indicator despite the pandemic uh, years. And now I'm going to hand it over to the incredible Dulce Delgadillo, NOCE's Director of Institutional Research and Planning, the Chair of the Non-Credit Research and Planning Group, RP Group, and the leader, one of the leaders for CCCAP, among many other hats that she wears. Thank you, Dulce. Thank you, Valentina. Good evening, board. Uh, good evening, everybody. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our institutional success and planning and really, um, you know, kind of after 50 years, how we have really institutionalized 
um, some really core processes within our institution that have strengthened us from the inside, right? Um, that includes launching several plans, including our institution-wide strategic plan, um, some local accessibility plans, uh, DEIAA action plans, and also implementing the second cycle of our departmental planning and review cycle. As a reminder, this is a homegrown process um, that we are taking uh, at NOCE to be able to really uh, use data to, do, uh, to make some data-informed uh, decision-making at a local level. Um, in the infographic that you were handed and on our dashboards, we typically present data on a one-year basis, but really we want to look at data as to how we compare to the previous year, right? So what you see on the screen here is really a comparison of what we looked like last year with our demographics and what we look like this year, right? And what you can see right off the bat in terms of our age group, we've seen increases in almost all of our age groups, um, and we've seen a 15% increase in our new students that we are serving compared 21-22 compared to 22-23, meaning that we are serving more new students than we did last year, right? So that means that we are bringing in new faces, new pathways, we are serving students successfully and onboarding them into those classrooms and pathways that we need, right, that they need. Um, we have also seen an increase in our Hispanic and Latino population. Um, and we've also seen a decrease in our other unknown. So that's really important for us as data people, right? We really want to know as much data as possible. So when we see decreases in those unknowns or those others, that's uh, really good news saying that uh, we're able to get that demographic information so that we can disaggregate our data and be able to slice it and dice it in different ways, right? In regards to our students' educational goals, we have seen increases in basic skills, in um, you know wanting to transfer, and also in uh, in regards to um, career exploration. Right. So this is really meaning that our students are really going and walking into our doors with an intent for these um, kind of these goals. And so it's really speaking to making sure that we're carving out these pathways for our students, right? Whether it's skill building, whether it's educational enrichment, or transfer seeking into our sister colleges. Another exciting finding here was our uh, drop in our unknown and undecided educational goals, right? Meaning that we have a um, higher proportion of students that are identifying those goals and um, making sure that they're letting us know so that we can help them carve out those pathways. In regards to the highest level of education, we saw an increase in our foreign degrees, right? So meaning, um, you know, that could be a foreign degree, a high school diploma, a PhD, an MD. So we, I think we still need to disaggregate that data a little bit more, but we know that we've seen an increase in that foreign degree in regards to a highest education, right? Um, and we've also seen a decrease in that unknown. So again, uh, improving our data quality. Um, in regards to our enrollments, um, we saw actually increasing uh, enrollments across all of our programs for spring 2023 compared to spring 2022, right? Um, but we saw consistent growth over the last uh, year in both our CTE and our ESL programs, right? Um, those numbers have shot up, um, but we have seen growth across all of our programs in this past year, right? In regards um, to this is actually a duplication because I can see that there are two. So um, we've already covered educational goals and highest level of education. How are students doing on their educational pathway, right? So we, we saw a little bit about the demographics. Now in regards to student services, this metric locally is really looking at our attrition rate of among the students that receive these services, how many enrolled. And you can see for both our orientation and our educational plan, we have increased this per, that proportion, meaning that the students who are receiving those services are enrolling into those classes that has increased, right? In regards to assessment, it's remained pretty stable. And to let you know, not everybody is required to be assessed. In fact, assessment is only a part of some of our um, non-credit programs at NOC. In regards to our course success, um, we saw increases in uh, summer and fall course success 
but we did not see, we saw a decrease in our spring success. So we're really trying to dig into that data and say, you know, what were some of the factors? We may want to look at modality. That is one of the um, uh, aspects that we're really uh, wanting to dig into as well. Uh, and in regards to course retention, we saw the same trends. We saw an increase in course retention in both the summer and the fall, um, but a decrease in the spring. So again, diving more into that spring data and understanding um, you know, what story is there. For term to term retention, meaning that did we retain our students, those who were intended to be retained, right? So taking into account those who graduated and those who transferred, taking them out. But those who should have been retained from fall to spring, what proportion did we retain? And you can see that that proportion has increased uh, a good amount from 48% in 21-22 to 65% in 22-23, meaning that the support that we are providing the students that need to continue on that pathway, we are doing that. We are helping them continue and persist in their educational pathways. Similarly, similarly, we saw um, increases in transition within NOCE. This is a local, uh, this is a metric that we mirror that to one that is at the state chancellor's office, right? So we're looking for smaller milestones, not necessarily transitioning from non-credit to the credit side, but did they transition from ESL to um, a, a secondary school, right, or a basic skills. So looking at transition within NOCE. And we saw increases in those transitions um, within NOCE within, um, in comparison 21-22 to 22-23. We did see a slight decrease in our non-credit to credit transition, um, but there is some limitations with that data, meaning that we, have, we can only track our students within our NOCCD walls. So if they actually leave and go to Long Beach City College, we're not able to track them. So that proportion is just a very small um, picture of what you know, they, could, they could have gone outside of our walls. Um, a huge success, as President Patel highlighted, was the significant increase in our graduates and program completers in 21-22 compared to 22-23. We saw all, all, more than a three-time increase in the ESL certificates, and we saw increases in almost all of our certificates, right? So all of these metrics are really shedding light on we are onboarding our students, we are helping them really get um, into that persistence mode and hitting those milestones, and they're completing that pathway. They're completing those certificates. That is another uh, transition, but those are the same metrics um, in regards to the momentum, which is the transition within and the transition uh, to credit side. So that concludes my uh, presentation, and I'll hand it over back to President Patel. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dorsey. Well, as our presentation is coming to a close, first and foremost, I want to express my um, deepest appreciation for our remarkable students. So students, I know you're here today, please wave. Okay. We are very grateful for your unwavering commitment and dedication to your studies. And we see and we recognize the challenges and barriers and competing priorities that you face, but yet you remain resilient and successful in everything that you do, even recently statewide leadership in, um, among student leaders. And to our esteemed faculty and staff, my deepest gratitude for your unwavering commitment to our student success. You're the cornerstone of our institution and Believe me, your dedication, hard work, and passion don't go unnoticed. It is due to your efforts that NOCE continues to thrive and evolve. If I could please ask all of the NOCE team members stand. And finally, a special thank you to Jennifer Perez, Julie Sheff, and our campus communications team, Jaisal Mata and Nancy Flores, for producing the beautiful annual report and a captivating video that captured the highlights of the past year. Your outstanding, consistently outstanding work really helps us promote the excellence of an OCE and tell our story to a broader community. Thank you.
Do we have any comments or questions from the board? Trustee Brown. Hi. Uh, first of all, great presentation. And you know, for years I've told people that you know, for me, SCE and NOCE is the Labrador puppy of our district. They're boundless enthusiasm, boundless energy. You want something done? Sure, we can do it. You know, how are you going to do it? We don't know. We'll figure out a way. So, uh, so I, I love that about you guys. Um, I had a question on this institutional effectiveness indicators. Um, do you have a copy of that handy? Uh, first of all, I think this is really attractive. It's got a lot of information in here in ways that are easy for people to see. And so I think, you know, this is a, a great tool for promoting NOCE. Question on the third page, uh, the bottom right-hand quadrant that has graduates program completers. Um, 1,632 total certificates and diplomas. Below that says by programs, and it's got the four uh, balloons that are broken up by the areas and numbers in there add up to 1632. So that, I assume that that's numbered in those. The next to that, it says by race, ethnicity. And numbers are much smaller. Those add up to 184, which I assume is the 184 in the basic skills program. Um, so I don't know if there's going to be, you know, version two of this. I would think, you know, there's two suggestions. One, if it's going to stay like this, that should be labeled that that is, you know, the BSP by race ethnicity because it doesn't correspond to the other things. And the other thing I'd question is why is basic skills being broken out when all of the rest of the four pages is about NOCE in general, you know, so. I, I, so. We, we do break, we break down our um, student population by several indicators, including race and ethnicity. It's one of our institutional effectiveness indicator. And in fact, the electronic version of our e IER report has the, um, the data for each of the programs as well as an OCE in general. And I'm wondering if that's what we meant to include an OCE level um, percentage or numbers by race and ethnicity. Oh, I'm sorry. And that would be consistent with the rest of the document. But if it's gonna be just basic skills, it should be labels that way. No, I'm sorry. This is actually, so, these numbers are actually, yeah, we have to um, we have to adjust these, but these numbers are duplicated. And these are numbers are number counts of students. So these numbers will not add up to these by programs. It's race ethnicity in terms of among the graduates, right? Individual students counted. So we will have to adjust that. I apologize. Um, but yeah, what it is is these are individual students that receive. So the race and ethnicity, but students can receive more than one certificate. In fact, many of our students, some, for some of our students, they may receive multiple internal certificates just within the ESL program, but it would still just be one student. So it was just coincidence that that adds up to 184, which is the same as the basic skills program, uh, uh, the total number that you had in the right next to the basic skills. Yeah, we will have, to, we will have to look to into the same it. Number, yeah, right. we'll have to look into it on double check it. Thank okay. you. Okay, well, hey, if this is going to be reissued, okay, label that a little better. Mm -hmm. But yes. other than that, I think it's great. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Trustee Rodarte. Thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Um, on slide six, where it talks about community engagement, the first bullet mentions that, and just correct me if I'm wrong, there's 75 new partners or over in general? 75 unique partners that were engaged throughout the year. Some of them are new and some of them are continuing. Okay. In looking at the new partnerships that NOCE has, um, is there a trend that you're noticing? Oh yes, absolutely. It's can you elaborate awkward. on that? I can get the numbers, but we had seen uh, a dramatic increase in the number of partnerships that we had formed in the last, I want to say, two years. Um, I think it has to do, like I said, with the way we had structured community engagement, where we have dedicated individuals in each department and a dedicated individual at the campus communications department. In fact, she's here, Nisha. 
who's been working very um, hard on reaching out to uh, community partners. And I think part of it has to do with um, post-pandemic environment where partners, agencies are seeking um, service providers um, and just the fact that we are open for both online and in-person uh, course classes and services, I think that adds to it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, I had a question about when our enrollment dipped from COVID. Um, what was, was there um, some programs that were hit way harder than others and were there certain age groups that were affected more and kind of what was the breakdown of that dip at the time? Was it mainly just courses that couldn't transition online? They had to be in person and so they had to get temporarily cut until those over or what? Yes, and that especially impacted our Emeritus program because almost all of the classes in our Emeritus program even now are held in person. That's the preference of our students, or at least for the most part, and just the way our facilities, um, our partnerships are structured with various facilities. And of course, we know that um, the death rates were much higher among older adults. And um, when, when our um, partners reopened, uh, many assisted living facilities reopened, we learned that uh, many of their patients either left or passed away. And that was just a very um, difficult reality. Uh, but that program is rebounding. Uh, one of the fastest growing, like I said, they've added 21 new locations. And as soon as we opened in person with classes in various locations, including assisted living uh, places, we had, we, we had seen an increase there. Great, and, the, and since, the, since the goal is to really get back enrollment and it is growing, it's getting much closer now. We're within a thousand, um, thousand from where we were before COVID. Um, I was wondering if we could at some point um, get a breakout of what our student makeup, what makeup was or our enrollment breakout was in the year before the pandemic compared to how it is now. So we can kind of see by category how it's catching up to where it used to be um, and where maybe we're gaining in the emeritus program, but we're not gaining as fast in other areas. I think it'd be really helpful to kind of see those side by side, like taking the COVID years out uh, and the dip in enrollment out and just kind of look at it where it's at today, because it's at 3,851 compared to what it was, which was 4,568. So it's getting much closer and it would be nice to see those categorically side by side. Um, and then my other question was, um, I believe it was said there was the like if students were to transfer or start education elsewhere outside of our district, that we can't really see that visibly. I don't know if there's, um, I thought we could for our community colleges. I thought there was a way to track other than private colleges, but if they went to like any Cal State or any other community college, I thought there was ways for us to look at that besides, um, you know, transcript requests or something like that. So I was just curious if there's any ability to do that um, or if it's not credit, it's just impossible to track them. Um, if they were to go to Long Beach City College, why wouldn't we be able to see our students um, that were enrolled here going there? Why would, would we have no visibility on that? I think it depends on whether or not our students end up getting CCC ID um, and, and if they go through CCC apply system to get that common ID that follows them from college to college, not all of our students um, have them and not all of our students use CCC apply, for example, mm -hmm. In emeritus program, CCC apply is not used um, for just a variety of reasons. Um, so maybe it has to do with that. It's much easier to track students who have a banner ID and then they have the same banner ID in our sister institution. I'm not sure if I'm yeah, right. so we have advocated for that, specifically that need for non-credit students and we are working, we're hopeful with the CCID um, as the chancellor's office is now requiring all students in the system to have that and we're in the process um, to be able to give all of our students that, we're hopeful that we will be able to use the tools that the Chancellor's Office can provide to be able to track our students. But right now, unfortunately, we're kind of limited to our NOCCD walls and then just how, how other tools at the Chancellor's Office are tracking us. Okay, thank you very much. And I just wanted to add, my last one's a comment. I 
at the last graduation and previous graduations, I've met a lot of students that had foreign degrees and they were here to hone their skills or do something that would uh, look impressive on their resumes here to get a job. And um, But a lot of them had bachelors from other countries. And so I thought that was fantastic that they're using NOC as a resource to, to improve their skills and try to get into the workforce here. So. Thank you so much. We, we find that trend increasing. Um, so much so that we had dedicated funding through our SEEP program and CAPE program to cover foreign transcript evaluation for some of the qualifying students. And uh, the comment was already made, but the, uh, the other thing, I think it would be nice to separate those from high school diplomas from other countries. You know, I would like to see college degrees separated from high school diplomas, because that to me is not necessarily a foreign degree. But, um, and then the only other question that I had was um, on the different programs that we had, and you don't have to give this to me today, but I would kind of like to know, um, for the, each certificate, like what the average range is for completion, like like a high school diploma could be somebody taking between one year and four years or how, you know, whatever. For each program, I think it'd be nice to know the average time that our students take and um, you know what the possible range is, like if it's a one year or it could be three years, depending on how many classes they take at a time. I think it'd be helpful to see that visually um, and to understand you know what our students, what our students entering in these programs are expecting if they can get it done in a year, or if they're part time, or if they can get it done in six months if they're full time. Or you know, I'd like to see that break out for each um, category, and that's just not necessarily for the report, just for our own knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, Trustee Lopez? Um, thank you, Madam President. So first, a great presentation, and thank you for all the uh, data and 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 congratulations on the. Um, outcomes and the enrollment increases. Um, I, I was particularly impressed by the increase in the uh, ESL numbers. W was there something that you did to accomplish that? Or, or, uh, and, and if so, what, what was it, just out of curiosity? I think it's a variety of factors. Our um, enrollment increased double, actually, in the last couple of years in the ESL program. Um, also, ESL faculty had uh, revised their certificates and the way they offer classes, um, allowing for students to complete faster. And um, ESL is one of the pilot programs for degree works, uh, where there is basically an aut automated system that's tracking certificate completions. And so we are able to capture students and may not even be aware that they have completed a certificate. Mm -hmm. And, and is that for ESL only, or does that include citizenship as well? If it's certificates, that should be for ESL, because ESL qualifies for college development, uh, or career development college prep certificate. Citizenship does not, and it is offered as a standalone class. Okay. Um, just one other question uh, regarding this document again on the, uh, the uh, statistic. Um, the indicators. So at the bottom of page two, um, there's one graphic that concerns enrollments by program and term, and then next to it another one that is enrollments by term. But the numbers are very different. Enrollments by program and term shows enrollments actually going up, and then enrollments by term alone shows enrollments going down uh, over the same uh, years. Uh, so I just wondered what, what that is about. Also, these numbers are not the same at all. The total numbers, for example, under enrollments by program and term for spring 2023 is about twice as much as enrollment uh, by term for spring 2023. So I know some of the, um, yes. So I know some of these numbers. So I know for the enrollments by program by term, those are going to be, um, so it's most likely we will have to we will have to check this, but I know that we are looking at all of our enrollments on the right hand side, and then all of our enrollments by individual um, numbers on our left hand side. So yeah, we will have to to check that. I apologize, um, but we have seen growth in our enrollments in terms of our most of our programs. Um, over the last year, and so we'll just, we will have to check those numbers again. I apologize. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? On second. All right. Good That's all. Okay. 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I think that does make sense if it's just total enrollment, because not everybody's in a program. Some people just take one class, so, right? So, but um, I, I guess my question is, you said that there's people that we know their intent uh, when they're enrolling in a program and their intent is to finish the program or to get a certificate, and then there's people it seems like we don't know. Do we know, how many people do we know when they're just taking like one class or they're doing an emeritus program and it's just they're taking like one class at a time and it's not really a long-term commitment or a commitment towards a certificate? So do, do we ask that question when they apply or pay for that class if they, if they intend to re-enroll or, or how do we do that? Because it sounds like we can't track 100% of the population, right? So how is it currently asked? In, in terms of what their goal is? Yeah, because it sounds like we're tracking if somebody says their intent is to stay enrolled into a certain certain point or to, to achieve a certificate or achieve a program, we can track those people. But then a lot of the total enrollment we can't track or aren't tracking or aren't asking, you know, if they intend to, how long they intend to stay or if they intend to come back or if they intend to take class after class after class or just this one class and they're done. How do we, are we asking that question or how do we, how do we track that? I can uh, maybe uh, offer some insights. We do collect data on educational goals. However, for especially non-credit, from what I've heard from other researchers, it's challenging to predict, uh, just looking at the goal, whether or not a student is going to stay for the whole program or leave after a class or take a class, come back, and then take a program. So what I've heard, and don't say, please correct me if I'm wrong, is the idea to look at the behavioral patterns and to see if a student, let's say, took two courses that are part of a certificate, that could be an indicator of an intention that a student would stay through <coughs> the completion of the certificate. We also are promoting um, completion of student education plans. Um, that's one of the indicators for our institutional effectiveness, and it's a requirement for our SEED program, and we actually proposed it to be a metric for Vision 2030, because we found that those students that do complete an education plan, it could be a, an abbreviated version, they tend to enroll and, and persist. So maybe that would be another indicator. Once they have a plan, we, we will understand what their intention is. Okay. And then um, to get on this list of total enrollments, you'd only have to take one class, or is it five people taking one class to add up to like one full time, or how does it, how is it calculated? It's, it's so enrollments is just registrations, right? Okay. And then we have head counts, right? So, so it's one person, one, one person taking one class counts. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. On the total enrollments by term, it's one and person taking one class. One person can have multiple enrollments. That's enrollment. Head count is one person, one head. Okay. So enrollments. So one person can have five enrollments. Yes. Okay. So it is counted by that's total classes then. Yep. And then where is it broken out for just how many students make up those numbers? Head count. Head count. Okay. Where, what page is that on? That's on the first page. Okay, yeah, okay, so total okay. Total, total, total enrollment, enrollment, unduplicated headcount. Okay, thank you so much. That makes sense. Appreciate it. One more question from Trustee Brown. One more thing I forgot earlier. Um, yeah, I'm on. Um, in your list of accomplishments, you mentioned highlighting or hiring a mental health resources counselor. We know that mental health support is so important in community colleges, among students, there's no reason to think it would be any less among NOCE students. And with your age range, it may be even more. So I just wanted to highlight that as a huge um, accomplishment. Um, and I'm so glad that we can, and that we're trying more and more to provide whatever resources we can for mental health support for all of our students. I have a, once again, thank you for this presentation. I know it takes a lot of work to put all this data together, so thank you. And thank you to everyone that has worked on this. I have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned drop rate, and, and we've talked about some students that are dropping. Um, what are we doing to reach out to the students that are dropping, and are we seeing any trends on a particular population of students that are dropping or in certain classes? In general, our drop rate rates tend to be higher in, I want to say, basic skills and ESL program.
versus, um, for example, DSS, Emeritus, and CTE is sort of in between. Um, there are a variety of factors that lead to students dropping out. Uh, we um, are taking efforts to collect this data through uh, reaching out to students and surveying them. Um, and we also have, um, like I said, we had embedded an outreach contact in each department so that person reaches out to potential partners and also works with stop outs. Um, and it could be through a phone call or um, a text message, um, but we certainly need to do more work um, to, to work on retaining our students, and it does take um, a lot of manual power and person-to-person -person connection. So we, we hope to find ways to invest into um, just more people who would be dedicated to making that connection. Thank you. Um, the other question was, um, you mentioned outreach. Um, and can you elaborate a little bit about the up, uh, outreach that's being done? I know that there was something that was shared that's a little bit more or new that it's being done at NLCE. Yes, we have, um, I think during the pandemic years, we have relied uh, heavily on what we may call marketing strategies. So we had expanded digital marketing, our online presence, uh, media buy, and we are still present, of course, in the media universe. But what we have added is person-to-person -person connection, person-to-a-community partner connection. So it took just being present at uh, community events, literally reaching out. We've always had a network of partners and we've kept track of them. So it's just reconnecting with them individually, inviting them to come to NOCE or going to their places and making sure that they still receive our uh, schedule of classes. That was another investment that we made that had proven to be very effective. It's just you know that book that, that people take and look through. Um, so making sure that our partners have our, our schedules and that they're properly displayed. It's the partners breakfast that we reconvened where we were together with our partners uh, in one place, not in Zoom, and uh, of course, power-up events, as I mentioned, um, that just, we invited partners to our campuses, and they were really happy to, um, to work with our team and, and our students. So all of that, just really boots on the ground, and um, a dedicated, um, organized effort, I think, brought those results. And I just wanted to also, thank you for that. I wanted to piggyback on what was mentioned about foreign degrees. Yes. Have, is there anything being done with credit for prior learning um, at all? Or is there anything that's being implemented in regards we, to that? We don't have credit for prior learning where um, non-credit courses are viewed uh, or counted as CPL for credit. But we are in the process of developing our own internal credit for prior learning where we would be including um, work experience and learning at other institutions towards completion of our programs. We have always had it even before CPL became a thing. We, for example, in our high school diploma, we've accepted any tra official transcript that students can collect so that we can count completion of courses towards our high school diploma. And in our CTE uh, programs, we had accepted substitutions where students may come and if they had completed a similar course. So we in informally, we have done CPL, but this is a time for us to definitely expand. And it's really great timing because just last Friday, I met Sam Lee, who is the MAP creator and leader. Uh, and he will be coming over on Friday, this Friday, to the Anaheim campus as part of the Vision 2030 work group to present on the MAP tool and to um, use NOCE as the pioneering cohort uh, or the first non-credit institution that will be embedded in MAP. Thank you. Thank you so much. That concludes my questions. And thank you so much for the presentation. Trustee Dunchy? Yes, thank you. Um, really good report. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I didn't have any questions initially, and then, and then um, some of the questions at Trustee Bent um, triggered a question. Um, I mean, a lot of these success metrics are um, more or less parallel um, what credit 
um, does with, you know, course completion and things like that. But um, has there been any exploration of other types of metrics? Because in things like, um, and is the LEAP program the same as the Emeritus program? Are those one and the same? At this point, yes. They used to have more programs as community services and parenting, but now it is focusing on Emeritus, yes. Okay. So, I mean, it, for the most part, I'm guessing those, that group and those students are not trying to get a certificate, but, you know, they might be, I don't know, like, um, my understanding is that um, for older adults, that the more that they socialize or health or keeping the brain active, it increases age and mobility and things like that. And anything like that been looked into? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we have definitely looked into that, especially because we've been involved in the Vision 2030 work and trying to serve and identify metrics that would be able to serve all of non-credit across the entire state, including our very large older adults program, right? So some of those we have talked about um, return or cost savings has been one, and quality of life, just quality mm -hmm. of life, improvement of quality of life. So those are some of those metrics that we have potentially looked at um, to be able, but also smaller milestones. We know for our students transitioning from non-credit to credit, that's a big step, right? That could take up to six years. So for us to be able to capture those smaller milestones of let's say, did they receive an educational plan? Or did they do an internal transition from lower level ESL to higher level ESL? We're trying to capture those to see what makes sense. Um, but to find a metric that cuts across all of non-credit can, can be a little mm -hmm. bit more difficult. Just to add, uh, one uniquely non-credit metric that we're looking at as far as recommending for Vision 2030 is engagement. And we would define it at this point <laughs> as a certain number of hours that students had put in or invested into non-credit uh, courses. Um, that's just something that I think is easily trackable, but certainly not all-encompassing. As far as Emeritus program, uh, we have also looked uh, at um, SLO assessments as being, or SLO achievement rates, as being a good indicator of success, specifically in those classes, because SLOs are uh, developed by faculty and assessments are authentic and unique to the discipline that they teach. Thank you. And, and again, I, I um, agree with Trustee Brown that, you know, the innovation and the excitement and the kind of all-encompassing, you know, I think you have students that are from cradle to almost grave, you know. <laughs> so really interesting program. And what a great asset to our community. Yes. Thank you. I think, go ahead. Sorry, Trustee Lopez. Sorry, I, I got clarification on the numbers. So just FYI, and we got summer and spring mixed up. So the 11,000 actually ties back to our summer numbers. So that's all, across all of NOCE, we had 11,707 enrollments. And for spring, we had 21,000. So that's where we see that increase in that spring, and we saw increases across all of our programs for spring, okay. except Thank for you. Speech Pathway. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, uh, Valentina and Dulce, for presenting. And I know we represent uh, a lot of the work behind the scenes from your team. So just mm -hmm. thank you to all of NOCE for what you do. Uh, it's truly uh, just one of the gems that we have here. And I always tease and I say, NOC is my favorite campus. And I'm going to say it here in public. NOC is my favorite campus. <laughs> I stand behind it. Uh, no, I love everybody, of course. But the work that NOC does uh, is exemplary. And if they can get it right, um, then we're on to something, especially mm -hmm. in building those non-credit to credit pathways. So thank you all for all the great work that yes. you do every single day to support yes. all of our students. <laughs> now, also from my favorite campus, uh, we're going to ask for the <laughs> Teacher of the Year nominee to be presented, so I'm going to ask Valentina to, uh, if you're ready, Valentina, uh, to read the bio, um, and then we'll follow that up with Cypress, and then Fullerton's presentation of their nominee for the OC Teacher of the Year. So, Valentina, please. 
And I'd like to invite to the podium our NOCE nominee for the Orange County Teacher of the Year, Miriam Rezai. about Miriam. Miriam is an adjunct instructor for the English as a Second Language or ESL and Citizenship Program. She was selected as our nominee for the 2025 Orange County Teacher of the Year. Miriam started at NOCE in September of 2018. After being a long-time multi-level ESL instructor at Access California, an NOCE partner and a social service agency supporting refugees, Miriam is currently teaching ESL integrated skills at the Anaheim campus. Miriam's students view her as a dedicated professional and highly skilled instructor, as well as an approachable and fun individual whose character qualities are worthy of admiration. Uh, one of Miriam's students explains the reason for nominating her for the OC Teacher of the Year Award. In the little time I have been taking classes with this teacher, I realize that she has many skills and qualities that surprise me. Well, she is very well organized, and you can see that she prepares very well to teach her classes. In my personal opinion, she is the person who has all the necessary characteristics to receive this award. According to ESL associate Dean Carla Friesler, Miriam cares deeply about the student's experience, both academically and in the real world outside of the classroom. Her mission is to ensure student success in all aspects of life in a new culture. And this comes across clearly in every interaction with her. Congratulations, Miriam, on a well-deserved award. everybody, members of the board, uh, campus community members, it's my honor and privilege to introduce the nominee from Cypress College, Dr. Kirk Domke. <laughs> Kirk Domke started teaching in the geology department at Cypress College in the fall of 2015 and has served on the distance education committee for the past year. Before starting at Cyprus, he taught oceanography and geology courses at the University of California, Riverside, Irvine Valley College, Santa Ana College, and East Los Angeles College. A quote that has helped guide Kirk in his studies and now teaching of earth sciences is, when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. And that's from John Muir. Kirk graduated from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in 2002 with a Bachelor's of Science in Geology, Biophysics. Went on to earn his Master's of Science in Geology, Paleontology, at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee in 2005 and attended the Uni University of Southern California for his doctoral studies. Fun fact, as we were talking this evening, we both were accepted to the same colleges out of high school, University of Minnesota and the University of Wisconsin at Madison. The difference is he graduated from Wisconsin <laughs> and I graduated somewhere else sometime later. <laughs> um, he has been married for one year to his wife, Angela Messino Donkey. And, 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 and are you expecting your first child this summer? Is that still accurate? There's two, so this is not accurate. So he's. <laughs> Doing a great thing, passionate Dodger, uh, I'm sorry, Cubs fan, slip of the tongue, <laughs> and a Wisconsin Badger. 
He enjoys camping and hiking and really just about any national park. So we are honored and privileged to have him at Cypress. I know our students were excited to surprise you with this nomination. So Dr. Kirk Donkey, congratulations. <laughs> everyone. So tonight I am proud to present our Teacher of the Year for Fullerton College to Dr. Aziza Delgado Noguera. <laughs> Standing in for Ziza, we have Jeanette Rodriguez. Uh, Ziza happens to be from a two-professor household and she's taking care of the children tonight. So uh, she sends her gratitude and I'm going to read her bio. Dr. Ziza Delgado Noguera is an associate professor and the department chair of ethnic studies at Fullerton College. She received her doctorate and master's degrees in ethnic studies from UC Berkeley. She is an alum of the California Community College system. She has served as the faculty advisor for the formerly incarcerated student club since she was hired in 2019. And recently, she was selected to support the Rising Scholars Program at Fullerton College. Dr. Delgado Noguera conducts research on and teaches about ethnic studies, social movements, Chicanx studies, comparative ethnic studies, education theory and praxis, transformative justice, women of color, and carceral studies. Her research, teaching, and campus leadership emphasizes the potential of education to empower historically marginalized communities. Please help me congratulate Dr. Delgado Noguera. So I just want to ask, um, I know uh, Ziza wasn't here, but the other two could come up, and we're going to take a group picture. Uh, and I just want to say congratulations to all of our OC Teacher of the Year nominees. Um, we didn't hear from them this evening in terms of talking. They'll have plenty of time to make videos and speeches as they're going to be recognized in November uh, at the larger ceremony this fall. Uh, so again, let's congratulate uh, our nominees for OC Teacher of the Year. Thank you all uh, for that. And with that, that will conclude my report, um, except for just to make uh, just some quick comments. So I'll take that back. Um, I just want to uh, thank uh, the folks and also the board for your support of the annual APAHI, Asian Pacific uh, Americans in Higher Education uh, support. Uh, we were a diamond level sponsor, and we had, I don't know, maybe about 30 or 40 staff um, attend. Uh, and participate in a recent conference. So I just want to thank folks. I know our own uh, student trustee, Chloe Serrano, was there as well. Uh, it was a great event, over 1,500 people. Um, I got a chance to make some remarks on behalf of the district, uh, and it was just a fantastic event uh, that has grown over time. 
uh, and I know it will continue to grow, uh, but provide a wealth of information and resource for folks uh, in serving our API uh, population. Um, so again, thank you all for that, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Great report this evening. <laughs> Uh, we now move to the approval of minutes of the regular meeting of March 26, 2024. Move approval. Thank you. Moved by Trustee Brown. Second. Thank you. Second by Trustee Berdarte. All in favor? Aye. 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 We will not have uh, a need for closed session this evening at, at this time. So we now move on to item 3D. Thank you uh, for President Rosales. Uh, so with this, this item is coming back to the board um, for uh, consideration of approval for a professional service agreement with RNL. Uh, and I wanted to uh, open it back. Actually, I got to turn it back over to you all for a motion. Thank you. I'll move approval. Second. Thank you. We're ready for discussion. Any okay. discussion? Yes. Sir. Trustee Brown? Yeah. Uh, there's two things. Um, this is a, as I understand it, it's a one-year contract to develop a five-year enrollment management program. Is that right? So by the middle of 2025, we will be uh, in receipt of a five-year program. Okay. And the other thing in the background, uh, the number five of the things they'll be doing was administration of proprietary student satisfaction inventory. It says our SSI. Is it our test or is it the contractor's test? Uh, so the assessment belongs to the contractor. They'll be administering it on our behalf. Okay. Go right. And I also want to point out to the group that Mr. Adam Conley is here from RNL. Uh, if there are any specific questions that the board would like to have addressed. Um, he also has a few comments that he can make as well whenever you would like to hear them to give an overview of what they would offer. Okay, so referring to the our SSI means it's for our students, our, our data, students. but it's their, their test, assessment. so they're the ones who would have to administer it. Okay, fine. Any other questions or comments? So my question is, what um, what other districts have you worked with in the past for this type of project, and what was the impact on the enrollment? Um, and it may not necessarily be a great question, considering that it might have been before COVID, and then COVID happened. But you know, is there any? Is there? Can you let us know, like, how this has uh, worked for other districts in the past, and how they use the, this knowledge to increase their enrollment? Sure, great question. Uh, first, my name is Adam Connolly, senior vice president at RNL. Thank you for the time this evening. Um, great question. So. We work currently right now with about 75 community or technical colleges, uh, and seven of them have been in conjunction um, with large area and regions um, such as North Orange County. Um, Alamo College County um, was the most recent that we worked with. Uh, we actually have had two engagements with them. Uh, we actually had an engagement with them prior to COVID. Uh, they saw it about a five to 7% increase in total enrollment headcount. More importantly, persistence rates went up each year, um, and there was an efficiency savings internally from a strategic enrollment plan. Um, the goal of this plan, um, and sir, yes, it is a one-year contract. The goal is by the end of this year to have a five-year plan that can not only have short-term goals that will move the needle, but long-term sustainability, not just for one institution, but for all three. Uh, we, we promise we will not take favorites um, of any of the institutions. Um, most recently, though, with Alamo, sir, we actually re-engaged with them in a very brief, what they called a refresh, which was basically getting them out of post-COVID. They wanted to come back to their plan, right? Because we all know every strategic plan needs to be fluid and flexible. So they came back, and we did a short, um, abridged version, basically updating post-COVID research to impact them. Um, we also work with North Carolina Community College System right now with a number of these programs um, and Pennsylvania Community College District as well. Those are the three most recent that we've done this work with. 
Thank you very much. And if you had your office in one of the campuses, you might have a favorite. Um, <laughs> but I don't have a favorite. They're all my favorites. So I don't have an office, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. So um, the other question is, so basically, you know, the way I look at this, you know, expense is that your, your company is an expert at this. This is what you do. Um, you specialize in this. And, and headcount to us is so valuable that we really only need to increase our headcount I don't know, 25, 50 people to pay for this fee, basically. I mean, is, is in a way, um, obviously there's more cost than that, but, but you know what I'm saying, it's, it's, it's not hard for us to justify this expense, and it sounds like that your company has uh, been doing this for a lot of years. How, how far back has your company been doing this? Uh, we've been doing this consulting work for about 30, 45 years. Mm -hmm. um, with community colleges at this level doing strategic enrollment planning while we're adding in surveys and market research, probably closer to 50. Strategic enrollment planning, um, not a joke. We literally wrote the book on it. Uh, you will all be getting copies of the book as part of the partnership, Dr. Lou Sanborn. So we've written three new versions of that book. Mm -hmm. So it is one of our signature services. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? One other thing I would just add, sir, your question about the surveys. I did want to confirm. Um, the surveys will be created for your students, for your campuses. So the surveys are actually your surveys. Uh, we, though, will administer them on your behalf and tally the results. But that data lives with you. So we're really just helping you with the lift of um, making the surveys uh, unique to each campus. We will then do the surveys for you. But all the data then comes back to you. So that is your data. Um, the question a little bit earlier about um, some of the questions with the NOCE would stop out and why are students not retaining or why are they stopping out? The surveys will help answer those questions. Um, it's a series of surveys that go out in a cycle. So we survey students before they enroll, right as they enroll, and then um, at certain time periods after they enroll to ask questions such as, what is your plan? Do you plan to enroll again? What are your influencing factors? Um, this helps the campuses get ahead of the curve to help make sure that we have student success um, as opposed to we find out they drop out and then try to find out, right? Why did they drop out? How do we get them back? So the surveys, um, the goal is to be a little bit more forward facing um, to get ahead of that curve. Thank Any you. other questions? No questions, but comments? Oh, yeah, just comments? another, oh. uh, well, one question I have um, is that with all the surveys that we have going out with our students, how will that be integrated so that it's not uh, a saturation of surveys that goes out? Uh, we have campus climate, uh, other student surveys I know that go out on a regular basis annually. How will we integrate that so that our students aren't getting over surveyed? Sure, sure. There's, there'll, there'll be three different surveys. Um, as we build these, the plan for uh, five years, one, while each campus has a unique population, unique goals, the goal is to bring this all together, right? What is the optimal enrollment for the district? How do we get there? Uh, we just heard about NOCE and some of their enrollment. That is one initiative that would be part of this plan of all three schools. The surveys, we would find out what is going out right now uh, to students, uh, but more importantly, what are we doing with that data? But the three surveys are actually not all gonna be dispersed at the same time. They'll be at three different cycles. That's on purpose to make sure that there's not saturation in the market. And uh, so the only other comment I had was for the board is that this was kind of a phase two of the peer resource team um, activities that went to all the campuses across the district over the last year, where we had a group of experts visit, meet with stakeholders, um, and talk about you know what some of our challenges have been with enrollment. Uh, so obviously some outreach, uh, recovery from the pandemic, we're also attending in different modalities, and we haven't necessarily looked at the data or where emerging markets are to uh, come up with projections, targets, and at the conclusion of this, this one year meeting that does involve all stakeholders, by the way, um, RNL will engage everyone uh, at each, on each campus to come up with unique plans and strategies. Uh, at the conclusion of it, we're going to have something that is going to be uh, a map that will lead us for the next five years to think about where our trajectory is going in enrollment that will help us with our budgeting, 
Uh, and so the timing is right to do something like this right now across the district. So I just wanted to remind the board that's how we got to this point where we're engaging with an outside expert uh, of resources, technology, personnel, uh, who can assist us and then let us out on our way over the next five years. I have a quick question. Um, what have been your like strategies that you've used for the actual enrollment once you get all the data? Like, are there any examples? I mean, we are our district is housed in a community that's very highly populated in the Latino community. Are you looking at the community uh, that that we serve? Yes. Um, so the first thing that we plan to do this spring is to do our market research. Uh, two areas of market research. One of them will be. Um, something called an enrollment projection model, where we will go out into your service areas and your market to one, find out how much, of the pen how much of the market have you already penetrated? How much do you have you already enrolled? We can also break that out between degree and non-degree students. So sir, to your point, we're trying to see how many students are taking one course, how many have plans to maybe continue. We can see that degree seeking, non-degree seeking. Um, we're able to do that by zip, um, and we're able to do that by campus. Um, so, yes, we, and then numerous other demographics, race, ethnicity, income level, um, even population uh, desirement in campus. Um, the other program uh, market research we will do will be on your academic program demand. So we will look at all your academic programs and do what we call an environmental scan. We will see where does industry have the needs, whether that's for your workforce programs, for your degree-seeking programs. Um, this will help with scale of efficiency. Um, there's a lot of good things happening on these campuses already, um, but there's not more resources coming. We need to be as strategic as possible. We're gonna use the data to help inform what strategies are gonna give you the best lift with the best efficiency and scale. Uh, the goal is to have a return on investment. So yes, we very much highly will use the data. Um, I get this question a lot of what's like one initiative. There is not one initiative that every single institution or plan has. I will tell you from a community college standpoint, um, student success is always a hallmark. It's not only about recruiting students, it's about making sure they retain and persist. Uh, we are gonna be highly engaged with faculty. Uh, this process does not work without faculty. Uh, they are the backbone to this. Um, so we're gonna be engaging them um, but right now, the biggest trend is advising models. The onboarding process for students, the advising models, how do we coach them to make sure that they're staying on their pathway, whatever their pathway may be. So that is where the surveys will help identify, are these students at risk? Are these students needing more? We can help identify that to then help your institutions uh, move the needle. Thank you. Quick question, are the surveys available in multiple languages? They can be, yes. Okay. We have uh, campuses in Arizona right now, and I believe the Alamo County one did them in multiple languages. Yeah. Jesse Lopez. Thank you. Uh, do you look at advertising? And if so, have you found that advertising has been beneficial in other districts? Sure. So part of the strategic enrollment plan process that we'll do is we will have six working groups. Uh, made up of multiple areas of each campus representation. One of the working groups will be a recruitment and marketing group. We will dig into metrics on marketing. Uh, where is the ROI? What is working right now? What is penetrating the market? What are students engaging? You know, we just, uh, it was great data before. Like, I felt like I was in one of my meetings. I didn't know I was going to get all this data, which was great. Um, but you saw the average age of someone going to, to gain a degree now um, has grown. Engaging that student is not the same as what it was uh, from a millennial student or even pre-COVID. So we will do an ROI assessment of all marketing outreach. I will tell you uh, right now that digital ads is probably an area that isn't going anywhere, but 46% of campuses say most of their marketing efforts and resources go to those digital ads. They're very difficult to tie back to return on investment and enrollment conversion. So I'll tell you, a lot of our work has always said to campus, we want you to dig into this. Uh, we will make some recommendations for you. These are some of your decisions, though, as well. But I can tell you, the ad space right now is very competitive. It's very expensive. We want to just make sure the schools are getting that return on investment for what you're spending. So if it's not digital advertising, what kind of advertising do you think might be effective? So we found that 
a mixture of using the technology, any CRMs that you have on campus in terms of email outreach. Um, you know, we, we actually still have calling campaigns. Our data will show that calling students at certain points in their stages actually still has impact. Um, we've also seen website and search engine optimization. Um, you know, majority of students are doing everything transactional on a mobile device now. So your website has to be optimized very well for them to find the information. Um, search engine optimization costs a lot less than some of the ad space. So we have found that leveraging very well. So just if I may, one more question. So when, when I drive down the streets of uh, Anaheim, <coughs> I see billboards that the uh, for-profit technical schools have advertising their programs. And uh, it always seems to me that we're not really competing with them uh, and they're taking students away from us. Um, so do you think uh, advertising of that kind or some other similar sort, even advertising on the radio or, or on the, uh, or on certain channels on TV would be uh, effective? Sure, so without looking at any of your research yet, here's what I'll tell you from my experience. I feel like uh, TV, uh, radio, your billboards, that is all brand advertising, right? That is your brand. Come learn more about us. Um, everything that I just previously mentioned, digital advertising, things of that nature, that's enrollment marketing. You want to talk to a student about a program and about a pathway. Best case is that you have the luxury and the resources to do both. You always want to have a brand. So we never say billboards are a bad thing. We also, though, will say, can you measure ROI in a billboard? Are you able to say 10 students saw that billboard and enrolled in one of your programs? So the balance is kind of the median, and that's what we're looking for. But we always say you can lead with brand, but you've got to be able to talk about program at the enrollment stage, too. Thank you. Madam Good Madam. questions. Thank you. Trustee? Uh, Trust question. We will ask uh, what social media, um, how they've heard about the institution they're attending, um, but what attracted them to it, which is not the same, right? How they heard about it and what attracted them are different. We'll also ask what modality they are looking for in terms of their educational experience. COVID has made that the number one question right now. So as you all look at your master facilities, resources internally, this data on enrollment is gonna help you make some of those decisions about modality. We would. Um, the data, though, is going to be um, market share. So we would be able to see where your students are going in terms of by zip code. We would not, though, be able to give student listings of actual students, but we can give you volumes and market share. So X amount of students are going to this zip code as opposed to your zip code where your campus is. So yes, you would be able to have some of that data. That's where it becomes strategic. The campus can then decide, is this an area where we want to go in and take market share? what resources would be needed to go take that market share. Um, demographic cliff and the changing environment now, campuses that want to grow are going to have to go in and take market share. They're trying to take us to I know. Yeah. Thank you, and that was my comment. I wanted to say that although I grew up in Long Beach, I hate losing students to any of the other neighboring districts, so um, thank you for pointing it out. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank answering for our questions. Time. Thank Appreciate you. It. Okay, we now move to voting. So we'll start with student vote. All of us. Roll call. Oh, oh sorry. Aye. 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 Yes. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you.
All right, thank you so much. So now we move on to item 3H, and this is our um, 2024 summit in Ghana, and we have um, some comments. Okay, do we have a motion? Comments first, Maya, sorry. Okay, so I will start um, with Mashonda Sal uh, Salisbury. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Good evening. Thank you, you have three minutes for your comment. Good evening. Do I start now? Okay, thank you. So um, I'm gonna introduce myself, Mashonda Salisbury, the Emoja Coordinator at Fullerton College. Um, dear esteemed board members, Sawabana, I first wanna say um, I'm the heart, I, it's, I have a heartfelt gratitude for your support and encouragement and for allowing me uh, to speak. Your commitment to fostering cultural and educational enrichment experiences is truly commendable and serves as a beacon of inspiration for us all. I am asking uh, your approval to participate in the African Diaspora Education Summit in Ghana. This summit holds immense significance. Personally, as a first-generation African-American female educator and coordinator of the Emoja program at Fullerton College, this is important for me as well as the scholars of Emoja. We strive to cultivate an environment of unity and empowerment. This journey represents a pivotal moment in our collective journey towards self-discovery and academic excellence. Amoja rooted in the African Swahili concept of unity serves as a cornerstone in our efforts to celebrate and elevate the voices of his and histories of African Americans. We firmly believe that by embracing our cultural identity and heritage, we lay the groundwork for academic success and personal fulfillment. The African Diaspora Education Summit embodies the ethos, offering a platform for dialogue, learning, growth, and to transcend geographical boundaries. By attending this summit, I am confident that I will gain invaluable insights and perspectives and forge meaningful connections with fellow scholars and educators from various colleges nationwide. Uh, this experience will enrich my own academic uh, journey um, as well, sorry, my own academic journey and also enable, enable me to contribute to the broader mission of Emoja and fostering a community of lifelong learners and leaders and student success for all students. In closing, I extend my deepest gratitude to the board for your steadfast support and belief in the, in the mission of Emoja. With your endorsement, I am eager to embark on this transformational journey um, and return with renewed vigor and passion to further our shared goals of unity, empowerment, and academic excellence. Thank you again for your continued support. Thank you. We move now to Marsha Foster from Fullerton College. If it's okay, um, we've just chosen three out of that list to speak. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Uh, can you tell me which? Uh, Keisha Shadwick. And Cynthia Guadardo. Cynthia. Those three are going to speak. Okay. Good? We have time to hear everything. Yeah, three? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Keisha Shadwick, and I'm a classified professional at Fullerton College. I am sincerely grateful for the opportunity to attend the All-African Disaspora Education Summit in Accra, Ghana. Participating in this, in this summit holds immense significance for both my academic and personal development. Attending the summit in Ghana deeply aligns with my aspirations to become a culturally competent leader and advocate for inclusive education practices. It provides me with a valuable platform to collaborate with like-minded individuals and contribute to discussions on critical issues affecting our students. Moreover, this experience will enhance my leadership skills as I engage with diverse perspectives and innovative ideas. 
as a classified professional serving as the recorder on the classified senate and being a member of several committees on our campus my dedication to students and leadership roles were recognized by Dr. Levo, for which I am deeply thankful. Furthermore, traveling to Accra represents a profound personal connection to my ancestors. As a black American, it offers me the chance to immerse myself in a culture that I have longed to explore and provides an opportunity for an unforgettable experience that will enrich my understanding of my heritage. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the board for their support and consideration in allowing me to participate in this transformative event. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> we now have Cynthia Gerardo. Hello, I'm Cynthia Guardado. I'm oh. going to try to do this in Thank you. three minutes. <laughs> uh, so as a professional learning coordinator in student equity and achievement faculty co-chair, um, which are the roles that I serve at Fullerton College, I believe the district should support the ADS 2024 Summit Colonization to Sovereignty, the Future of Educating the African Diaspora. In spring 2022, the state rolled out C2.0, which asked California community colleges to take a race-conscious approach to the, the to the development of the C2.0 plan. In addition, the state asked community colleges to select one DI group for each metric. Fullerton College selected black African-American students for all five metrics and additionally selected Hispanic and Latino students for two metrics. Um, they were disproportionately impacted in all five metrics. Um, so as we prepare to write the C2.0, uh, Fullerton College's Office of Institutional Effectiveness Review DI data found that black African American students and first generation students were disproportionately impacted in all five metrics. The data shows us that black and African American students are disproportionately impacted in all five metrics and are often also first generation college students. For this reason, Fullerton College uh, C2.0 plan set the following goals in which we're still in progress of. Um, Fullerton College will identify and integrate current processes, policies, and culture that impede equitable outcomes for racialized minorities. Professional development training will be designed for all employees to ensure they are prepared to support black African American students and develop an infrastructure to increase the persistence of our black African American students from semester one to semester two by involving stakeholders including faculty and student services to achieve the goals in year two and three. This work is underway at Fullerton College. We are currently developing a race conscious certificate to train C funded areas and course redesign for equity will launch its first cohort for instructors this summer. We believe that attending ADS 2024 summit as a college and a district is vital to the learning of our campus leaders. Our intention is to bring back what we learn at the summit and develop the necessary support systems to educate and train our current staff, faculty, classified professionals and managers so that we can in fact retain and support our black and African American students to close DI gaps. So I am asking for the board support for our whole district, not just Fullerton College, because this is necessary and our data shows it. Thank you. My apologies. I'm just going to call you the name. If, you're, if you wish to not speak, just let me know. But if you are, please come to the podium. So Nicole Winburn. Thank you. Virgil Adams. Cypress College, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it, uh, the board, esteemed guests. I, I could just say what, exactly what she said. <laughs> that was beautiful. Um, I'm, a, I like to say, a longtime member of the NOCCCD family, Cypress College. I'm professor of human services, sociology. And when I started, it was a, well, let's say 6% uh, African male and female educators and two, a little over 2% students. Well, it has inverted. It's now 2 to 3% faculty and 6% students. So the problem therein is we don't have a adequate amount of information to meet the need. And the need is our African-American students are missing the opportunity to understand the richness of their heritage, mm -hmm. to appreciate their legacy, and to have a non-Eurocentric approach to not only education, but their own personal value. How do we get that? Well, you gotta go where it all began. 
and that is to Africa, as they say, the mother country. So we have an opportunity before us, and as mentioned, it's not just Cypress College, it's district-wide, to provide meaningful education to those students who have yet to be afforded the opportunity to appreciate the richness and the wealth of the heritage to which they belong, and we'll say systematically was taken and removed from their own sense of presence. And we as educators, district-wide, are responsible to make that right. So this is our great opportunity to say, how do we invest, how do we instill, how do we incorporate, how do we put back what was never there and give an opportunity for us as faculty, as those who lead, to educate and continue a legacy with our students. I have the privilege of being the African Male Education Network and Development co-advisor. I will, uh, if allowed, join with my co-advisor four other Dean, well, managers and three deans, one director, and then four faculty, one being myself, one adjunct, and then two remaining faculty. What will we do? When we come back, we will provide workshops, flex training, opening day ceremonies, continuing ongoing education with a two-year commitment to make sure that at least we start the legacy and continue that, and hopefully we'll revisit and have an opportunity to re, uh, uh, shall we say, revisit Ghana and other African countries, the Gold Coast, uh, at Cape Cod, and other areas that have great richness of wealth and great riches of heritage and great richness in cultural diversity. So that's the challenge we have before us. I thank you for the opportunity, and I appreciate the uh, forum of which to tell what we need to do as a district in North Orange County Community College District, and I'm proud to be able to say, with your blessing, we are going, and we'll come back with great wealth to spread. Thank you. We have Sam Foster. Thank you. And then Joel Sacedo. Thank you. Thank you so much. That concludes our comments. Do we have any other comments on this item? Thank you very much for all of your comments tonight. We really appreciate it. Do we have any questions can from the board? Um, can I take a motion? Do we? So moved. Okay, oh. so moved. Regarte. And Trustee Dunchy. Can we have a roll call vote? Can we have discussion? Okay, sorry. Uh, so I don't know if we want to ask um, Vice Chancellor Williams this question, but my question is, um, or Dr. Breland, I guess first, um, wasn't the registration fee already um, approved last meeting? Or Okay, that, that's all perfect. The only thing is they included the registration fee in the recommendation, I believe, so, uh, or in the, let's see, in the total cost. So basically to me, we're only approving tonight, a hundred. they're asking for approval for 137,725, which is everything but the registration fee because the registration fee was already approved. Yeah, it was 29875 We're going to take that out of this 16760 which would mean what we're asking for today for approval is 137725 which is the remaining of these fees. Can you repeat the amount, please? 137725 Now is that, I didn't have any other questions. I just want to make sure that we're taking out what was already approved previously.
Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Any other comments? Questions? Madam President. Justice Lopez. So, um, this is no fun, but um, I'm inclined to vote no, and I just wanted to say a few words to explain that vote. It sounds like a great event, and I hope everybody has a great time. It's, uh, I'm sure the board is going to approve it. But um, personally, I just tend to look uh, skeptically at international travel in general for district staff. Um, after the showing that the professional development could not be obtained you know, in the United States. Um, and I tend to think that taxpayers uh, look at it the same way, and that that's why the board policy requires the board to review international travel and not domestic travel, because the board policy recognizes that trustees will have a greater sensitivity to what taxpayers think about this sort of thing than with the staff. Um, and so that being my view, that the taxpayers would tend to look uh, negatively on uh, international travel in general, um, I, I tend to be inclined uh, against it. But the other reason is because this does establish a precedent different kind of travel request than we have seen before, at least in the time that I've been here. It was 25 employees going. It's a very big uh, program, a very big event. Um, so it seems to me that we would be establishing a precedent here and we could expect to see other groups coming forward. So the Latino employees will say, well, we want to explore our routes too. So we want to take 50 people to the coast of Spain for a couple of weeks. And Asian American uh, employees will want to do the same and go to Asia to stay at a resort there. Um, and so this, it's, we, we just haven't seen this sort of thing before, but I think we can expect to see more of it, and I think that might be the wrong track. So, um, again, I think it's a great event, and, um, and I hope everybody enjoys it, but um, I think I'll have to be no. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Trustee Brown. Yeah, I just respond. I understand, you know, what Trustee Lopez is saying, um, and I guess I see this, it is the first time something like this has come up, and it is, in that way, a unique situation. If this same thing came back to us every two years to be done, you know, that would be a different situation for sure. Um, I know uh, there are learning opportunities and experiences that can only be uh, obtained at a location um, going to the Louvre and seeing the Mona Lisa is not the same as seeing a picture of the Mona Lisa. So I'm going to accept on faith and you know, previous experience of you know, uh, benefits of foreign travel and education that there are use, there be useful, unique opportunities in this uh, forum that people would not be able to have by going to a classroom in the US. But I think that your points about this potentially setting a precedent that could come back to bite us is something we need to keep in mind, um, that I'm not seeing this as hopefully opening the floodgates to a lot of similar things from every identifiable group saying, well, you know, uh, it happened in Ghana, so it should be happening everywhere else in the world for everybody else. So I think that your point is very well taken, that we need to be aware of this and, you know, keep in mind what kind of precedent this might serve. But in this case, I'm willing to accept that um, this is a unique opportunity that will provide opportunities that will be beneficial to our district and our students that the same 25 people could not get by going to a classroom in Riverside. Thank you. I also wanted to re make a comment and res not respond, but just kind of do a general comment. I honestly think that this is long overdue. I, I feel that the experiences that our, our population communities are having on campuses are very, are very, are, are, have been heard very loud and clear. So I, I definitely am looking to support this and I, I encourage that we really support this because we need to have these experiences also to bring back what we, the experiences we had, and I'm including myself, I'm not gonna be there, but I'm just <laughs> generalizing. But the experiences that are going to be had with this trip, and I think it's very important to bring back 
those experiences and apply what you have learned and educate us all as to why this is important. So for me, I, I think it's, it's, it's great. Thank you for bringing it forward. And I, I do see the value. I myself am from Mexico. I was born there, but I was raised here. And going back to my homeland country, it, there's, it's priceless, right? Every time I go, I, I, I know when I need to go back to feel grounded. So for those reasons, I think it's very valuable that we consider um, supporting this. And um, I applaud you, and I can't wait to hear all that you can share with us. That concludes my comment. One other comment, if I could? Yes, Trustee Brown. Yeah, um, kind of a follow-up. Since this is the first time, these people are pioneers for us, and it is incumbent on them to come back and make the case that there was enough value for this to make it worthwhile. Because if the follow-up activities that are being outlined cannot make that case, then uh, certainly it would not be something that I would be looking to replicate. If they can make the case that this was valuable in ways that could not have been done in other ways, I think that is you know, certainly important for justifying our approval of this and for how we will view any further requests by any other groups. Thank you. Trustee Serrano. Trustee Tanchi. And that is that um, I certainly support this as a historian. I understand um, the primary sources to going to the place. It's not the same as reading about it secondhand. Um, I support it because it's well documented. There's a lot of good statistics to say that this is a, a group of students. Um, that um, is not succeeding at the same right. It's part of our, um, our um, uh, goals. It's part of the goals of, of Vision 2030 for equitable goals across it, and so this should help with that. Um, and then thirdly, it, it's very well, I, I hear loud and clear the commitment to come back to the campuses and to, to uh, integrate it so that it's not a, a go visit and then, you know, show travel pictures, it's, it's really a concerted effort to plan and to change and to provide services um, for a group of students that are not succeeding as well as they ought to be. Any other comments or questions? I just wanted Bent. to say for the record, I 100% agree with Trustee Lopez and Trustee Brown on this one, So, but I'll be voting to approve it, and um, I look forward to hearing the feedback from everything and all the experience that everybody's had there. Um, and how it can be incorporated into our campuses. But I completely understand um, the reluctance to approve international tra travel at this level, um, but we do ongoing training, and the, to me the flights were $1,500 $1, round trip, and you can't even go to Florida for really less than a few hundred dollars anyway. So um, so I think, it's, I think it's, you know, it's in line. I'm sure we're getting a group rate, and the idea that these people will get a great experience and new education to bring back to our campuses. Um, I think that's going to be a real benefit. And uh, But like Trustee Lopez, I'll be watching this for future. I don't think this is something that we would want to approve every single year. Um, I don't even think this conference is offered every year. I think it's, isn't it like, is it every year? Okay. All right. That's the end of here. They're, they're there. Let's see the benefits that come back. Um, as far as the expense on this time, I'm happy to approve it, and we'll see what um, comes back from it. Thank you. Thank Any you. other questions or comments? We're good. I agree with you. I want to. I, I'm looking forward to seeing how it's going to be applied and, and and the amazing things that will come from this. So, yeah, thank you for that. So that concludes our comments and questions. We will now move to vote. Yeah. 
Aye. 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 I hope everyone has a wonderful experience, but I have to be a no. Yes. Yes. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you. We now move to item um, 3J. Authorization is requested to enter into travel arrangements with AIFS for the Spring 2025 Study Abroad Program in Portugal. Do we have a motion? Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. back to the board uh, in light of the, the previous discussion uh, around uh, travel involving uh, an agency. And there wasn't necessarily clear direction to take it or change all contract language. So what we wanted to present to the board uh, were two options um, for this evening's approval. Uh, that would include um, basically uh, the fee uh, going toward the agency for the travel So we have a question. Let's start with Trustee Bent, and then we'll come back to this. So taking out those um, expenses they were going to originally cover, did it lower the amount in any way or give any kind of reimbursement to students? Absolutely no change. No change money-wise? They're so generous. Can we, yes, can we have you come to the podium, please? Thank you. Yeah, explain that, please. Thank you. If you can introduce yourselves, please. Annie Wilson, I'm Dean of the Library Learning Resources Division. I oversee study abroad, study abroad among other programs. I've been in this position for 10 years. I'll let Angela introduce herself. Hi, I'm Angela Henderson. I'm a faculty member at Fullerton College and I serve as the NOCCCD Study Abroad Coordinator. So uh, we go out to bid and uh, we have used other vendors in the past. Uh, we have been using AIFS uh, the most. And w it's an industry standard to ask for an inspection visit because when we're sending our students across the world, <coughs> often it's the first time that they've been abroad. Um, they don't sometimes know to advocate for themselves if things aren't right or if something in the contract hasn't been provided. So it's an opportunity for us to go and just check that things are the way they're supposed to be. It's also an opportunity to deal with um, any discipline problems that may come up, it happens from time to time uh, with students or to troubleshoot problems that faculty may be having while they're abroad. They have a lot going on. They're teaching their classes. They're helping their students. They don't have time to run down some of this um, troubleshooting. So that's what we do. Um, AIFS as a company is, uh, there's two wings. There's a for-profit side and there's a not-for-profit side. Um, their for-profit side uh, deals with direct enrollment. We don't have anything to do with that. But the proceeds from that they get from that side, they funnel over to the nonprofit side, which is part of the community college exchange. So that is why that they are able to provide the inspection visits for no cost to the student or to the college. If you look at those proposals, it's the exact same price for the student whether there's an inspection visit that they pay for or there's an inspection visit that we pay for as a district. 
or no inspection visit. So that's kind of how they, how they run that. Did you want to add anything? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's how, are there any questions? Any other questions? Trustee Dunchy had a question and then Trustee, okay, Trustee okay. Bent. Yeah, so the discussion that we had in the previous meeting was we wanted to uh, pay for that trip on our own as a district mm -hmm. and then have that money be just reduced by that amount and given to students to lower their costs. And this company is saying take a hike? No, um, so that was for the Paris program, Okay. right? And so what we did is basically we paid for the visit and then AIFS took that money and gave it to our students for um, meals okay. at the FIOP, the place that they're living. But it's, um, it was us paying for that. Yeah, so it's an ongoing thing, basically. This is, a, this is a continuous thing. So every single time you do a travel visit, it's always included. And there's no way to have that separated, to have, I mean. That's just not what they do. And any vendor that we've ever used, it includes a, an inspector inspection visit. So it's just what the industry does. It's not ever put into the student fees. When you're looking at the program proposal, that's all the student fees. Those costs are never put on to the student. Because we've asked in the past, well, let's not do a site visit so that it doesn't change the cost. So, and we work really hard to make sure that we get the most economical bid for our students. And Danny and I and our faculty and staff have worked really hard to also get scholarships because we know that the costs are expensive. We're trying to offset those. So in the last three years, we raised almost $20,000 and we've given out all that money. So um, we worked really hard to also get scholarships for the Benjamin Gilman. We got seven for the Paris students alone. Um, and we've been These are national producer. scholarships. Yeah. yeah, we've been recognized twice as being top producers of that scholarship. So I think for us personally, we're really passionate about making sure we do everything to give this opportunity to our students. Um, less than 10% of community college students and university students will study abroad every year, and the population of community colleges is about 3%. We're the only community college in Orange County that offers this opportunity. So it has opened up doors for students to get better jobs to get into colleges of choice because they're developing these um, skills to communicate and be flexible and you know soft skills that business, businesses look for. And so it, it is shown in the research that they want these kinds of experiences for our students. So I know, you know on the surface it looks like it's a lot a high dollar amount, but um, we are a lot more economical than even cost of fulfillment in all our proposals. I have a quick question. Oh, sorry, too close. How many times have you had to travel to the site visits on? We've been doing this since 1987 um, as a district. I've been in this role since 2014. Uh, Angela's been in this role for 2019. 2019. Uh, before her, it was a different uh, faculty coordinator. And uh, we send a representative or two, depending on the situation, to every program. We typically have one, two, three, four, five to seven programs per year. We've increased uh, exponentially. We're, we've sent our, we're sending our first uh, CTE specifically focused program this summer with our manufacturing program. So we've, we've really just expanded. Um, the only times we feel comfortable to not do uh, an inspection visit is when it's in a city that it has very um, good infrastructure, like a city where the headquarters are, for the vendor is located and they have a lot of staff on site, or when it's a very experienced set of faculty members who have done this multiple times, um, although it's, it's pretty rare. And, and when we haven't fulfilled an inspection visit, we've sort of kicked ourselves because things have gone wrong. I mean, as an example, um, we had a program several years ago to Buenos Aires, and um, everything was fine. I, I, I did that particular site visit. I was on, uh, I was inspecting the um, housing for the students. I went into, a, it was in um, the summer, which is their winter. I walked into one student's room and it was freezing cold. And I said, oh, it's so cold in here. And she said, well, yeah, it's a little cold. And, and oh, it, it, I said, why is there a towel under your, window and she said oh well it's just because it leaks and so it gets real wet so I just change the towel every day it's fine I'm like it's not fine <laughs> she, she oh I, I didn't want to say anything I said did you tell your teacher did you tell anybody 
well, no, I, I don't want to be a bother. It's like, well, no, no, no bother. Uh, the, the company needs to provide, this is not AIFS, by the way. <laughs> this is a different vendor that we used. Um, and so I was able to rectify that, got her in an, an apartment that was safe, that where, where she was comfortable. And it's just, it's things like that every time something happens um, that we're able to rectify. So is there a reason why there has to be one to two people going every time? No, and it, it, sometimes it's one and sometimes it's two. It depends on the scope and the length of the program. It depends on the number of students who are going. It depends on the location. Um, Angela really deals with the, the faculty side. There's things sometimes when, the, when she gets there that the faculty don't want to tell me as a dean, um, issues, classroom related issues perhaps, that's more appropriate for her to talk to them about. I tend to deal with more of the um, contractual items with the vendor and then the student discipline. And then typically when you go, what's the time frame of the visit? It's four days. Any other questions or comments? Trustee Bench? How many different people are trained to go on these trips to do the inspection? Two. Just Angela two? and me. Okay, so there's no, I thought you said there was other people that go on these sometimes. Mm, I'm sorry, no. Okay, so. It's either it's either one or two, so it's either one of us or both of us, depending on the so scope So at least one of you goes on five to seven trips a year, basically. Yes. Okay, and is there any other opportunity to cross-train anybody else mm -hmm. to do those kind of trips so they can gain some sort of international right. knowledge and we experience? Could. My role is one on reassign time, so I am actually on the end of the next, you know, cycle. So it'll go before the academic senate. So then part of it is I would train that next person, you know. So um, as she was trained by the faculty coordinator before her. So you have, sorry, you have a term then? Your term is expiring, or how long it's, is the it's term? It's a three-year term, and then there's um, a clause in there that it's provisional like a, upon agreement it can be renewed for another three years mm -hmm. okay and so you're that's a, is that a role of the academic senate then you're selected for that mm -hmm. okay okay thank you very much so as a coordinator it, it's always the coordinator that has to go it can't be another faculty member is that correct no because I think you know one of the things in my role is I work with the students to talk to them and do the student interviews I go out and advertise the programs I'm also working really closely with the faculty as they're designing their programs so there's you know there's a level of trust that's been developed over the course of that time you know, like if you think of like our um, Sevilla team that we sent in spring, we started recruiting after, you know, in 2020, we were still recruiting, you know. So um, I think like she said, you know, I've served as a department chair for seven years here. I know what it is to lead faculty and have that respect and trust. And I know how there's certain policies, you know, the faculty go representing our district, right? And they're, they're in a role over there abroad that dealing with discipline and stuff that they might not have had to deal with, right? So I think, you know, the person that's going, kind of, I have a full perspective of the program. I work very closely with the AIFS vendor who's here on campus, Paula Messina. She's dedicated to the campus. I've gone to trainings with, you know, NAFSA and stuff to learn more about study abroad, the protocols, safety issues. How do you handle things? Um, I've worked with Danny as well as um, other faculty members on campus to get better training on communication. So I, I don't take my role very lightly either because I feel like I'm there to support the faculty as well as the students. And you know, as you know, as educators, when you have some issues, it's really important to handle those and handle them in an appropriate professional manner. I, I also agree that it would open up a great opportunity for other faculty to also be trained uh, to have the opportunity to serve in this capacity. Um, I, I do understand the role of the coordinator as well as the you know, dean and all that, I understand that. But giving others the same training so that you know, if you wouldn't be able to go, that there would be mm -hmm. someone else that could go and it, again, opening it up for an opportunity for that to happen. And we would have be, a study abroad committee too, so we could begin maybe with that committee. Great. Sorry, I've done one more question. And if you could kind of explain what happens in a four-day period, I think that'd be also helpful because I've traveled a lot for business where I've gone exotic places and I literally worked to the bone and I didn't see a single thing. I didn't see a single sunset. And so I just wanted to know, like, exactly what, what are these trips to you? I mean, how does, this, how does this work as the coordinator? Because I'm sure it's not, like, a, a gift to be there. You have to, you're working the whole time. So tell me what's going on in four days. Uh, the standard things are inspection of the classroom space, inspection of the 
home stay and or apartment spaces. So every, every location's different. Sometimes they're in home stays, sometimes they're in apartments, sometimes they're in dorms. We'll inspect all that to make sure that everything is um, provided that the contract stipulates it will be provided. Then it's meeting times with the individual faculty, uh, making sure that they have their needs met. It's meeting with the students, making sure that they have their needs met. And then it's meeting with the vendor themselves. The on they always have an on-site facilitator there from the vendor, so working out issues with them. And so that pretty much takes the four days. Um, Sometimes, I mean, it's been, there's been times where we, you know, it's like 16 hour days because of, there's a problem and then we're running around trying to mitigate it. So um, there's not a lot of downtime, to be honest with you. And it's a, it's a tight four days. Okay, and then another question is on, on a lot of my companies when we do travel like that, sometimes people try to take a couple extra vacation days so they can enjoy two days themselves. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's an option for your trips? We can, I mean, we can take vacation, yeah. You can't? Well, I mean, I, I, because it's in my role as the district, you know, coordinator, I get a sub from my class, but, you know, That's true. I'm coming back in the teaching. summer, you're not mm -hmm. teaching, but. So, you know, leaving in the middle of a semester for a week, you've got to come back and make sure you're on the ground with your students. Okay, I'm just, uh, I just. And I I'm, have a kid at home, too, that doesn't like me to be gone that long, so. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm just trying to, to understand the cost benefit <laughs> works, you know, the whole thing, because uh, when somebody goes on a trip for five to six times, it's like, it's like a huge deal. These people are going, 25 people are going to Africa. It's like a huge deal. But if one person was going to exotic places five to seven times a year, it's just something we have to justify as a board and understand what you're doing. So that's all I have. Thank you. Trustee Lopez. Um. So you don't have to sell us on the program. I think we all support the program. But the issue that came up last time was who should pay for the site visit. Correct. Should it be the district or should it be the vendor? And the feeling was it should be the district um, because, because otherwise it appears that the vendor is giving a gift to the district or maybe even trying to influence people who will be in charge of making a recommendation as to whether they should get future contracts. Uh, and so it's, it's better just to avoid that appearance. and. Um, and, and since the employees are going on district business, the district should be the one to pay. I think that was the, the general feeling. And so I think that would be my preference in this case as well because I, I don't think there's, there's no difference, of course. Um, just Can I make a comment about that? Sure. So uh, we've been doing it this way with the vendor paying, like I said, since 1987. It has um, any vendor that we go to, that we go out to bid to, it's included. So it wouldn't be like, Ooh, let's go with AIFS. They're offering an inspection visit. Kappa's not. No, Kappa is too. I mean, that's just they all they all provide it. It's a standard operating procedure. So yeah, it, and, it, and, I don't see that it would be. And I can see why. Um, <laughs> but that's the problem. Uh, it just looks like a gift to the district and looks like a way of influencing, you know, decision makers. Um, it doesn't feel like a gift when you're there. Working 16 hours, just saying, but yes, well, I, I see what you're saying. Well, it's a gift to the district, not to you. I mean, you're the employee. You have yeah. to go. The question is whether, who should pay, the district or, or them, and, and it seems to me it should be the district since you are a district employee over there on di doing district work. Um, <clears throat> so um, you said that one or two people go, but when we were discussing the Paris, uh, Paris trip, it, it seemed that three people were going. Is that mm -hmm. not the case? That is the one and only time that I've seen that happen, yes. Um, we wanted our college president to see what it was like for our students. Mm -hmm. It's a study abroad is a terribly impactful in program. Um, it changes it. I know it sounds cliche to say it changed students' lives, but it does. I was a study abroad student. I know Angela was. It certainly changed my life. Um, we wanted our college president to see that firsthand, to see how our students were blossoming, growing, how profoundly it, it impacted them, and so and also to see really what it's like. I think I, I know that there's a perception of, oh, must be nice going to Paris. It's like, yeah, it's the hotel room and the office and the, um, the, <laughs> the classrooms are great. <laughs> I didn't see the Mona Lisa, actually. So, you know, um, we wanted her to see that as well. Yeah, and my understanding was that the vendor did too. And, and again, that's, that's kind of the problem. Um, well, it was my idea, to be honest. I, I, I asked if there was a way that we could extend an invitation to our college president. I, I really, truly wanted her to see that. So it was my idea, but okay. they agreed. Um, on another note, what, um, what course is going to be taught here, or what courses? 
in Lisbon, yeah. ethnic studies and mindfulness. And English. And English. We always, on the semester long programs, we always offer a, a selection of courses that, that covers kind of all the different general ed areas. We work with our counselors. We have a rep from Cyprus and um, Fullerton College. The students have to take a combination of 12 units. They have to be enrolled the entire time. So they, um, and we make sure that the GE are such that they really fulfill their educational plan. We get the students to have one and we make sure that they transfer. It, it seems like it would be kind of nice to have a course that was somehow related to the culture of, uh, of uh, France or Portugal or wherever the, the program is. I mean, Well, right, we had French in France. You did, okay. Yes. And part of the faculty proposal is we want them to use the city like a classroom. We want to see them tie their curriculum and their student learning outcomes to that location. So the, I personally have led a study abroad and I've also had a sabbatical. I did way more work on my study abroad proposal <laughs> um, because you have to really look at that. So we want them to see what readings are you doing? How does that tie into that location? How does the history come in? Like Leonor did, um, Leonor Cadena did anthropology. So she did a whole, you know, the witchcraft and religion and did all of the history and stuff about the gypsies and took them to locations and talked about it. So that is our like, whole purpose and focus and why study abroad is unique in the learning style and the what the faculty are doing. And it really gives the faculty an opportunity to shine and to use their curriculum and their courses in a very unique way. Okay, well, since we're giving, we're, we're being asked to choose between two options as I understand it, so I would move that we go with the option of um, having the district pay for the site visit rather than the vendor as we did for the last trip. I would second that, and okay, one second. Oh, we have to go. Yeah. Well, as I understand it, though, the motion was not for a particular option, was it? We were given two options, so I'm not sure what the motion was for. Okay, so we don't need a motion. So I'll, I'll back up what you're asking for uh, without the motion, and then um, hopefully everybody else agrees. I have a quick question. Just to clarify, um, we did ask if they would um, do a proposal that would um, break it up for us, right? Did we not? For the company, AIS. Is it AIS? AIFS. Right, thank you. Yes. I, I was, I'm not we just sure omitted this the site inspection, but then you, they, there no, no change is the cost to the actual students or the proposal. Right. Got it. Okay. a question. Um, Vice Chancellor Williams, was this your team that did that bid or asked for the different contracts? Was it your team that, that asked to have some sort of rebate for if the district was to pay for these? Okay. Yeah, so I mean to me it's like whatever this vote is today, like I'd like to kind of go back to the drawing board on this thing and just have like Vice Chancellor Williams team like look at it as far as see if there's any kind of negotiations that can happen because I think that that basically there's no reason to give this company free money. They've built, they've inflated their costs on us to build in to cost to pay for this. And if we want to pay for it, to me, they should be lowering the cost to students or somehow that money should be discounted then. So I know it's too late for this one or whatever, but going forward, I think we need to look at this. I want to, I think the district should be paying for these. Um, but then that amount is clearly inflated in their current prices to cover it. That's just how business it works. I mean, they're not giving anything away for free. They're paying for it. There's a cost, and they build it in their bid. So going forward, I'd like to have that looked at at a district level. Thank I guess. you. Come and note it. I think there's a question or comment. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh. <laughs> I would like to add that the, the cost that was we actually paid for the for the last visit 
wish I could travel at the expense that they actually build us for. They have economies of scale that we cannot even approach. And so uh, the amount, I forgot the amount that we paid, do you remember how much? 4500 4, for three individuals to actually travel for the airfare in the hotel. So we would have spent that just on one, one person. So if we're actually having to coordinate all of the travel ourselves versus using the company that specializes in the, the study abroad and the travel abroad. So there is, I, I'm, I would support the recommendation since that was in the original contract, it's always been in the contract that we take advantage of that saving district resources. So when's the contract up? We have a contract for each and every travel event. So, so okay. So, ne so next travel event, we can negotiate something different. I mean, we could certainly try, but you saw what the, the, the discussion that we had on this one. It's the same contract. The way they explained it to us is again, they use the proceeds from their wing that is a for-profit center to fund community colleges for this kind of site visit. So they think it's important. They think they want to support it. If we don't use it, that, that's fine, but uh, it doesn't change the contract any. And this is the way all of the vendors present it to us. Yeah, it just makes no sense to me. But I, I mean, and I've been in business for a long time too since, you know. But um, okay, so that's very interesting. Um, that's fine. I mean, Thanks. just, I mean, I'm fine to approve this one. Uh, I'd like to do it where we're paying for it or reimbursing the company for the cost. Okay, we have uh, Trustee Brown and then Trustee Dunchy. Sure. Um, first, I think it's it's been made clear that these inspection uh, visits are not just junkets for the people going. They are important. Um, they're not fun. So I think, you know, the value of them is there. Um, I think it's a mistake to try to carve out the uh, the cost for that and uh, say the district should be paying for it because there's a perception that somehow that is influencing us to choose this company, given that every company who provides this service does exactly the same thing. There's no reasonable argument I can see that says, well, somehow that is, is trying to persuade us to choose them. So th that doesn't make sense to me. Um, so if we say that we're not going to accept the inspection as part of the contract, we're instead going to pay for it. We're saying that we want to pay more, which is a, a misuse of public funds, that we are going to pay more for that by paying for it for ourselves to make ourselves feel good that we're not being potentially influenced than we are, you know, it, it, it's an unnecessary cost to the district that serves no purpose. So if there were only one company that was providing this as part of their contract and there were other ones that say, no, we don't do that, okay, fine. Then there's an argument that say you want to go for the one that doesn't include it. But this is standard practice in the business. Every company does it, been doing it for decades. I don't feel anyone can say that they think I am being influenced to choose AFIS or somebody else because they're going to provide you know, this, this intense study experience or this intense inspection experience for one or two people that is not fun. Um, I'm, fe I'm not feeling any persuasion to choose AFIS or someone else because of that. And I think that we are shooting ourselves in the foot trying to say, well, we should be carving that out or failing that, we just won't take advantage of it. Instead, we'll just add our own costs on top of it. That's that's not a good use of public funds. So I do not support trying to change the standard contract, keep doing what has been done because it works, it's a standard practice in the industry, and it is the less expensive option for the district because we're not adding on our own additional costs on, on top of what we would be getting for free. Thank you. Trustee Dunshee. Um, yes, um, I think um, Trustee Brown summed up my feelings quite well. Um, I, I don't know if I can really add much more. Um, although it seems like there is a well-established process of choosing study abroad that involves 
appointment of a coordinator through the academic senate and things like that. So for the board to step in and disrupt a what has seemingly been a pretty good process for quite some time it is, I really think, micromanaging not only this particular contract, but also um, a process that is well established with participation from faculty um, for the good of our students. So, so I, I also do not support that. Um, I also think there was a lot of focus on the um, one, co or one or two coordinators that go to do the site inspection, but my under, and correct me if, if this is not a right understanding, but the, the faculty members that go for the full length of the program, those people rotate pretty consistently, correct? So the only part that is repetitive is the site visit for the very short period of day, four days, and the long uh, immersive program is, is being rotated by various faculty. So it's not like the same people get the benefit. It's, it's a variety of people. The only ones that consistently do the works are the ones that it's part of their job description, correct? Thank you. I just want to make a quick response to that. Um, my apologies, but I'm not familiar with, so I think it opens up an opportunity to clarify some questions, so that, that is why the questions were asked. Um, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, asking clarification, because although you are the experts, I am not an expert in the area. I'm faculty, but I've never um, done study abroad, so I don't have the background from my perspective. So I think it's very appropriate to ask those questions. Um, I'm also, I, and I don't think anybody's arguing the fact that there is value to study abroad. I think, just wanna make sure that you know that, that we, we are definitely for that. And there's no, um, getting clarification does not mean we don't support it. It just means we need clarification. Um, so just wanted to kind of clarify that. And the logistics that you know, the board is responsible for, I understand the concern that Trustee Lopez has. And so it's looking at everything and seeing what's the best interest for the district. And that is our role, to make sure that we are asking these questions and that no one takes it personal because we are getting clarification. That's our job we are held responsible to certain things. And I think asking questions is very much, um, I value that because that opens up an opportunity for making things better for our students and for our district. So I just wanted to make that comment. And I believe Trustee Ben has a question or a comment. Yeah, how many companies bid on this trip to Portugal? For this one, hmm. um, we have decided to no longer uh, engage with the other two vendors that we've used in the past because of a lot of problems that we experienced. And uh, there's no other vendor that can meet our district's uh, liability uh, number. So we used to send it to the two others, but then we decided it's folly. Um, for after using them and the disastrous results, we don't want to use them again. Yeah, and there's three companies in the world that are available and we're not using two of them. How many companies can do this? I, I don't know how many companies can do this. Uh, there were four that we had, one went out of business. Uh, many of them did go out of business after COVID or through COVID. Um, there are two remaining that are, that could meet even um, theoretically meet our liability requirement. Any other company I've probably reached out to over the 10 years 12 to 15, I think about 10 of those have gone out of business due to COVID. Um, and as soon as I, you know, just tell them what our what our requirements are, they say, well, we can't, we can't accommodate that. Have you taken a look at the study abroad programs at all the other community colleges and districts in California? I have. I have we go to a lot of, <laughs> a lot of conferences. And do they all use AIFS right now? Is that all they have? No. Some use the, uh, some of the other, uh, other districts don't have as high of a uh, requirement for liability insurance, so it opens up a greater number of vendors that they can use. Okay. Um, I, many of our colleagues across the state that we've talked to have used one of these other two vendors that I've mentioned. Um, a lot, of, Some of them do use AIFS. Okay, um, Vice Chancellor Williams, questions for you please. Um, at what point does a program like this rise to the level of your department when we have people that are specialized buyers that get bids all the time, bids and contracts? Um, how, mu how much, when you had a program like this, 
how much is determined by the campus people making the decision versus the district shopping around contracts? On this particular one, we were we have to rely on the campus. They're the experts in this. Okay. I mean, if that's something the board would like to do in the future, would it be something that could be shopped around um, we, we to other companies? I mean, we, we certainly could for the next uh, contract. We could intervene and. We probably would rely on Danny and her team to, to oh, yeah, help not, us in yeah, that. We, can certainly, the process, but we yeah. can certainly do that. Okay, thank you. So we also work closely with Tammy. I just wanted to give her a shout out. She helps us a lot uh, with the risk management side. So um, she's been instrumental in helping us hone in on which uh, vendors are appropriate. So we do look at liability. We look at trip cancellation. We look at medical, make sure that we have coverage. And I, I will say, you know, um, they've been a very successful company for us. We've had some very successful programs, and our students have had really good experiences. So um, they seem like they're going well. I appreciate it. The reason I'm asking the question, honestly, is because we're told, and it's just taken as, as solid gold, that it's always included. Every company does this. and. Like I've been around industries where the entire industry got busted because they were doing something inappropriate. And just because they all do it doesn't make it right. So I'm just curious if that's really true. That's what I'd be interested in shopping around in the future. I share Trustee Lopez's concerns on the matter. Um, and it's nothing personal against you or anything like that. So that's it, thank you. Well, all the ones that we've gone out to bid for have. We'll say that without We have two more questions or comments, Trustee Brown and then Trustee Lopez. And yeah. that'll. Sure, thank you. I'd say, you know, it would certainly make sense that uh, the study abroad would be um, approached the same way we do any other per personal services uh, uh, contracts that, you know, we can, you know, send out uh, requests for proposals and we evaluate them and, uh, you know, as professional services, there can be a number of criteria. Um, cost is one of them, performance is another, um, experience, uh, that kind of thing. And so, yes, it certainly makes sense that we would not be looking at the whole study abroad program as if it were a single source, you know, renewable forever contract. So, yeah, I, uh, I would certainly support, you know, shopping around. It may end up that AFIS is the only one that can really meet our requirements and has the track record to do what we want. And if that's the way it is, Great. Um, there's nobody can then criticize, you know, whether you know the board, the public, whatever, um, you know, that that we have haven't done a due diligence in trying to find the best value, which is really what we want. So I would like to add a couple of, of, of comments. That first, the district does not have any costs associated with these programs. They're completely funded by the students and the funds that are raised by the, the campuses. So when, when you ask about do we get involved, we're not actually paying for this, so it's not something that we're looking at from a technically uh, purchasing uh, arrangement. This is one we look at best value, and as you heard uh, Danny talk about, it's, it's, it's not, we're not looking at the low bid, we're looking at the best program to meet our needs. Thank you. Trustee Lopez. Um, thank you. So, you know, I continue to think that the district should pay for this, and I, I think we're just having the same conversation or debate that, that we had last time. But um, it, it does seem to me that we should be able to negotiate a reduction in what is being charged to the students if we're going to pay for the uh, travel for the site visit. And if the contractor is unwilling to do that, then I, I think we should look at other contractors and, and, and make that arrangement with them. Um, not not for this one, but uh, going forward, uh, if they're going to be uh, so uh, strict about that or, or uh, unbending, then I think we should uh, we should look at other contractors. Um, so in terms of where we are, so I offered uh, uh, a motion to um, have the district pay, and uh, there was a second. So where are we? Is that if is, is that has has that been accepted as a friendly amendment? If not, I'll, I'll offer it as a formal amendment. No. 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 <laughs> Which is is the same thing that happened last time. Yeah, same thing. So I will offer that as a formal amendment. Just so we're clear, formal amendment 
Second. Can you repeat? Can, can, yeah. We yeah. One second. Yes. Sure. One second. Sure. Could you repeat that one more time, please, Alba? this particular okay I think what we did with the Paris one which I'd be fine with is that we're reimbursing that company for them out like we're, we're reimbursing them so we're still getting it for whatever that discounted rate was for the travel but we're reimbursing them for that so it's well, not like I, no I think with, with in this case we would simply be not including the site visit in the contract and, and just paying higher for it okay. separately that's fine Got it. Okay, so we are going to be up. get clarification, Trustee Brown. Sorry. Yeah, clarification. You said that there with AFIS, there's the for-profit side and the not-for-profit side. We deal with the not-for-profit side. Do they essentially operate as two different uh, businesses, two different cost centers, so that um, it doesn't make any difference to really the uh, the non-profit side? That, how I put it, that they're getting funded by the for yeah by the for-profit side to pay for that part of it, which would be why that they would not reduce their cost to us because it doesn't make a difference to them in the sense that they're not really paying for it anyway. It's the other part of the company that's paying for it. Is that correct? That's our understanding. Are they a publicly traded company? Their stock. I still get stakeholders aren't. Okay. <laughs> I think we're done with clarifications, we were right? In for discussion. The nonprofit side. Okay. I don't know if nonprofits are publicly traded. Uh, no, I'm talking about if the for-profit side is giving away money to a nonprofit side without telling their stockholders, that would be a problem. But it could be a private business. I don't know. I really don't know. Okay. to voting now. Thank you for all the comments and the questions. I think we're ready to vote. So we're Correct. Okay. Yes. Nay. Aye. No. Aye. No. No. For any clarification, yes. Just, just can you please, uh, can you just repeat it so that we can have clarification? And thank you. Thanks, Alba. Okay, roll call vote, please. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we now move to item 6A. It is recommended that the board mark its ballot for the California Community College Board of Trustees, Board of Directors election. Let's see. Do we have a motion? Oh, I see. Oh, sorry. Can we open up for discussion? Thank you. So I, I will make it kind of easy. 
it in that um, there are, we get to vote for seven candidates and there are seven incumbents. And I would like to move that the seven incumbents be re-nominated. Thank you. I was going to ask you about that. Are the, so are those all good? You've worked with every one of them, so. Yes, yes. They're, they're good. Um, there's a nice diversity between multi-district and single district. There's a diversity around the state. Um, there's a nice diversity as far as um, ethnic background. Um, I have positive things to say about my fellow board members. Um, I did watch the tapes where many of them participated. The, uh, I guess they could give a, a short, forum. yeah, the, what did they call it? Candidate forum. Um, you know, some of these people are very highly recommended. Nan gomez Heitzberg was just put on the Board of Governors for the whole state. Um, you know, uh, a real strong commitment. Uh, Deborah Akita serves um, with the ACCT on the Diversity Committee. Um, so they not only have um, reputation or they're not only involved in and statewide efforts to promote and advocate for community colleges, but several of them are also involved in national advocacy. Thank you. Trustee Ben. Sorry, can you remind us what the term limits are? Three years. No, three years, but I mean, is it three three year terms or? Three, three year terms. Okay, thank you so much. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, go ahead, Trustee Brown. Yeah. Um, if it's the will of the board to support all the incumbents, I can live with that. If there is not that will, I believe that one of the incumbents, based on the application, I thought there was minimal, minimal thought given to it and very little discussion of, of either big or little issues. And so if somebody wanted to support um, replacing Yvette Davis with one of the other candidates I think is stronger, I would push for that. But if the, uh, you know, if consensus is to go for the incumbents, that's fine with me. I just, go ahead, Chester Rodarte, go ahead. May I ask who you would like to replace? We, before we go there, can we make comments first, if you don't mind, and then we'll come back to that. I mean, I prefer just to quickly know who you would want to. I want to make a quick comment before we, we do that, if that's okay. okay. Um, I, I have a little bit of an issue just voting incumbents all the time and not really um, looking at all of the candidates. And I know that they all do good work. And, and going, putting yourself out there, everyone that's here is well qualified. We know that. And just really making sure that we are, you know, really paying close attention to what we want um, moving forward for like the next three years. Um, three years and then just voting um, incumbents just because they're great and they've done a great job. I mean, that sounds great. But if we are looking for also new ideas, it's an opportunity to vote in other uh, members that can also do good work and bring in other ideas. And I agree that there are some incumbents that would be great that we should consider keeping and that there are others that we might want to consider, um, you know, having someone up step in on their behalf in a sense. That's just my comment. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, there are several others who I thought were good. I was particularly impressed with Julie Shore from Grossmont Bayamaka, who has been, you know, she's finishing her first year on our local board, but mm -hmm. she's been in K-12 for 30 years, and she mentioned there is nobody from the San Diego area on the board, so that would provide <coughs> some geographic diversity. So I think uh, she would be my first choice as a replacement for Beth Davis. Thank you. So can I respond? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, and I agree. I would not uniformly just say all incumbents are great. I would never say that. Um, I think as long as I've been on the board, this is the first time where, where all the slots were filled by incumbents. In, in every other time, there was an opportunity to, to bring in and you know, different ideas and different people and things like that. Um, I, I uh, hear um, Trustee Brown's um, concern about the paper um, part of Yvette Davis's. Um, when you fill out those forms, you're limited to the number of wordings and things like that. 
variance severely. Um, so in the um, candidates forum, I thought she did a much better job um, talking about her experience working with community um, and, and the outreach and things uh, in, in and around Glendale. Um, she's a, a, one of the things she does is she's a, a big sponsor of the arts uh, in the area. Um, so um, I think that that's a nice additive that she brings to the table. So again, um, that's kind of why I would uh, continue to support that. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Okay. I think that's a great idea. Let's go ahead and start selecting our top five, and then we can go from there. Is that okay? Say again? Top five, and then we can go to seven, yeah? <clears throat> Trustee Lee Lopez? You know, I, I didn't expect that, so I haven't quite rated them like that yet. I, I would like to think about that. Okay, Trustee Rodarte? I'm okay with having the incumbents, with the exception of Trustee Davis and we'll support Trustee Brown in having some representation by adding Trustee uh, or Julie Shore. Okay. She's not an incumbent. I'll give you everything. Sure. Okay, Trustee Brown. Um, I think I would just go with what Jackie said. Um, you know, put the uh, the incumbents. Oh, certainly, you know, Dan, Dan Gomez and Deborah Kia will be at the top. Put the other incumbents in whatever order works except for uh, Julie Shore and Tracy Beth Davis. Thank you. Trustee Dunchy? Uh, well, I'll stay with the seven incumbents. Okay. Trustee Bent? I don't really have a preference between the two but being debated here, so I would just appoint the six. Uh, we've, we don't always have to do seven. I would just appoint the six incumbents that we can agree on. Um, but if you guys want to fight it out for that seven, well, you're welcome to it. So, sure, we don't have to vote for seven. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'll just go with the. I agree with it on the six. So. I'll go with the seven. You'll go with the seven. And okay. Yeah, I think it would be great to have representation from San Diego, so I'm gonna go ahead and go with Julie for this one. So everyone, and then Julie from Grossmont Community College. <laughs> Can we have a student trustee vote? No, I don't think we have a tie, we have a three, two. No, no, I didn't. I don't, I'm keeping out of that. So I only nominated the top six. <laughs> yeah. So it's between them about the seven. No, no. Okay. So I'd make a motion to approve that if we do that. I thought she was well qualified and made a point that there were several others that were equal or would, would have been really good too. It, it is a valid statement, so I'm not going to. Yeah. I'm happy to. 
Thank you. Any any other comments? So second. So is it that we have a majority for six of them and three votes versus two votes versus no vote for a seventh one? Yeah, we're nominating seven. Thank you. So, so we're looking at a slate of seven that includes Julie Shore instead of Yvette Davis. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. To me, that makes sense because that's how the vote, the board kind of voted for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm fine with nominating seven. Okay. All right. I think we have what you need, Elba. Okay. Can we move on to vote? Should we go out to bed on that one? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. Thank you. All right. It is recommended that the board discuss any potential future agenda items. Do we have any items? No. All right, so now we move on to Chancellor's staff. And we start with Ms. Valentina Patel. Thank you. A few updates from our campus. Um, as I mentioned in my earlier presentation, NOCE um, has expanded its partnership with the K9 Companions, and uh, now we are rolling out uh, Poppies for Positivity events on our three campuses. Students and staff will enjoy an afternoon of wellness with therapy and service dogs. This event will have a dual purpose. We will celebrate a graduation from puppy training of our current um, dog in training, and we will meet our next dog in training, Lyndon III. Um, and thank you, Trustee Brown, for commenting on the mental health um, awareness and, and efforts at NOCE. Um, so having hired a coordinator for mental health uh, support, now our counseling and student support department is hosting an eight-week workshop um, series on emotional wellness. And that includes topics on managing stress, overcoming trauma, self-care, and mindfulness. The workshops uh, will be offered weekly in person and then repeated in Zoom. Our Rising Scholars program celebrates Second Chance Month with a series of workshops as well, including a workshop on restorative justice led by the Underground Scholars program from UC Riverside, and also Adverse Childhood Experience Trauma workshop offered by our parenting instructor, Dr. Aaron Sherrard. Um, and finally, NOCE, again, to the point of our community engagement efforts, NOCE has been invited to participate in the Settlement Support Center event. Um, and it's from April 16th to 20th, and it's hosted by the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and USCIS. The goal of the event is to connect local refugee families with various services, including housing, employment, medical care, counseling, and adult education, and NOCE will represent adult education. Thank you, this concludes my comments. I think we move on to Dr. Cynthia Lebo. Thank you, everyone. I am happy to invite everyone to Black Student Success Week at Fullerton College. This is building on the statewide California Community College Chancellor's Office. This year's theme is building a better future together. The urgency is now. Fullerton College has a slate of events happening April 22nd through the 26th, and we invite everyone to participate. Also, I am pleased to announce that on Wednesday, April 17th, I will be hosting 
NANDI, a new statewide organization for black professional women in California community colleges, and they'll be making a trip here to spend a few hours with us in community for North Orange County Community College District, and that will happen from 2 to 3.30 in Building 100, Room 127. I'm also pleased uh, to report that we had accounting firm RSM, the CEO and Chief Operating Officer, visited our college and over 100 accounting majors, students attended the event. Here they were able to ask questions and prepare for their future career and the CEO is so excited to see 100 accounting majors that he promised me he'll return and they just really love to see that engagement. This Saturday, a few of us represented our district at the Estrella Awards, where we saw President Sylvia Alva and the Dean of Business, and we just mentioned our students and how eager they are to transfer, and we thank them for their continued partnership. Also, I was invited to Cal State Long Beach as a featured speaker for Women's History Month, where I joined the president of Cal State Long Beach and also the past president of Whittier College to talk about uh, being a woman leader. I also want to thank Dr. Jorge Gamboa. He led a group of our young men to Cal Poly Pomona um, for their Young Men of Color Transfer Day. And it was really awesome to see that effort come through. Finally, I want to thank Denise Fierro and all of our staff in CalWORKs, Foster Youth, and Rising Scholars. Uh, we were able to finalize that 174 of our students will be receiving monthly stipends from Higher Up, a fund that our district was selected to administer to our students. And these funds are gonna be really helpful as they continue to navigate uh, Fullerton College. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Olivo. So we now move to Dr. Scott Thayer. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, just wanted to share a few things. Today, we hosted over 60 vendors and more than 300 students as part of our annual career fair. The event took place in our Gateway Plaza and students connected with potential employers in the uh, areas of public service, healthcare, and the hospitality sectors. Um, there was also information for students about internship opportunities. Um, the students were connected to our career closet, uh, our LinkedIn photo booth, and our handshake on online job board. So really a successful event this, this afternoon. Um, on Monday, hundreds of students and employees headed to the pond to observe the solar eclipse. Um, the rare opportunity won't happen again in the continental US for decades. And our astronomy professor, Michael Frey, and his students set up three solar telescopes for viewing of the eclipse. Many also use their cell phones to take pictures through the telescope's um, eyepieces. Um, in addition to thanking Professor Fry for his work, I'd also like to thank Trustee Dunseeth for participating. Um, I was at the pa Equity Pathways event in Anaheim, so I got to see the eclipse there. So I wasn't on campus to witness it, but it was a, a wonderful event that we were hosting there on campus. Um, if you miss the eclipse, but still want to check out the skies coming up just after sunset, on Thursday, April 18th, Professor Frey will host another event, weather permitting. Um, he shares that we'll get our last glimpse of Jupiter, the great nebula of Orion, Castor of Gemini, and a great double star and other objects that evening. So come on over on Thursday, April 18th to check that out if you're available. Um, Want to welcome home our theater arts students and Professor Donnie Jackson, who spent spring break in New York City, New York, with students. They visited Juilliard, NYU, and the Circle in the Square Theater School, um, where, where currently we have two alum at, at, at that location. They also visited the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the 9-11 Memorial, as well as multiple Broadway shows. So anyone interested in next year's trip, um, please feel, feel free to contact Professor Jackson, um, who shares that those dates will be spring break of next year. So exciting that our students get that opportunity. And finally, um, just this morning, we affirmed the Presidential Scholars of Distinction for the class of 2024. Um, this group of nine scholars was nominated and selected by faculty in each of our nine pathways because they represent the values of our programs that they're enrolled in and because they've achieved 
and persevered through their studies at Cypress College. Um, so we're in the process of notifying those scholars. I actually received an email tonight thanking me for the letter we just sent out to one of our scholars. So it's nice to see that they're reading their email and responding. Um, it's a $1,000 scholarship, and the students uh, will be receiving that shortly. So that's my report, and thank you. <laughs> thank you for that report. We move now to Mr. Fred Williams. No report, thank you. Ms. Irma Ramos. Three minutes, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, we are here to share an overview of the exceptional leadership uh, demonstrated by our HR division under the guidance and vision of Vice Chancellor Irma Ramos and the profound impact that it has had on our institution and the community college system throughout the state. Throughout the year, we will highlight the accomplishments and the strategic plans for each of the following departments, uh, which include benefits, uh, labor and employee relations, EEO and compliance, employee-focused DEIAA programs, HR operations, talent acquisition, and professional development. And now I'd like to turn it over to Yasmin. At the district level, Vice Chancellor Ramos and Associate Vice Chancellor Kosick have led strategic priorities including talent management, innovative practices and technological advancements, the employee experience, DEIAA, and HR excellence, moving North Orange towards the destination district. We've also been instrumental in leading numerous board resolutions, showcasing our commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. At the state level, North Orange is a pioneer in designing and piloting equity programs, influencing recommendations at the state level. Many leaders across the state seek advice, guidance, and mentorship from our district. Vice Chancellor Ramos has also been a pivotal figure in executing the Vision for Success's DEI Task Force Implementation Plan. Vice Chancellor Ramos's leadership has been instrumental in addressing key areas of the plan, leading to meaningful change statewide. I'm also proud to share that Vice Chancellor Ramos received the inaugural ACRO EEO DEIA Champion Award. Shared directly, uh, uh, sharing directly a quote from one of our, or the longest serving Vice Chancellor in Human Resources in the community college system. And I quote, he states, I have worked closely with and have relied on Ms. Ramos for over, more than two decades. I easily rank Ms. Ramos in the top three of the current chief HR officers, and mind you, that's out of 72 districts, who lead our complex and challenging system, which we all know is highly political based on simply doing what the right thing is for our college and for our students. As an HR team, we commend Vice Chancellor Ramos for her outstanding contributions to our institution's advancement and the broader community. Her dedication and leadership have truly propelled us forward. Thank you for your time. And that concludes HR report, and I'd like to submit this for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. We move on to Dr. Sherry Liebug. Not here, but I'm not sure if anybody was here. And Ms. Kaiser is not here today, so we move over to DMA President Teresa Kassin. Hello. I'm, Hi. I know it's late, but I just have a quick statement. <laughs> um, I wanted to acknowledge the NOCE report and the amazing work the entire campus does. Bravo. What an amazing 50 years. Um, and I wanted to call out and specifically say thank you to the next DMA president that will be taking over on July 1st for all the work she does with their ESL program. I think you saw their numbers today and that's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to call out a manager specifically for doing some of that. 
I also wanted to say a big congratulations to the Teachers of the Year. These three faculty represent a tremendous amount of innovation, drive, and care for our students. Um, at Cypress, I've worked with Kirk for many years and can say he consistently is innovative, showing creative ways to reach out and engage students both in person and via online instructional technology modalities. And whenever something needs to be tested for DE, he's my first person. <laughs> so I wanted to mention that as well. Um, finally, DMA is very excited um, to be working with the Chancellor and the Chancellor's staff and HR to be planning a district summer all managers meeting. Um, we're going to be working on best practices, connection, mentorship, and equity planning. So I'm very, very excited to do that. First time in four years. Thank you very much for that. That's it. Thank, Thank you. Have a good you. night. Uh, Jennifer Wu, I know it's the uh, Academic Center President, Dr. Lee. I want to hear for her, right? Okay. Kathleen McAllister, she's a Cypress College Academic Senate, not here. Jeanette Rodriguez, Fullerton College Faculty Senate President. I also just wanted to come here to congratulate NOCE for their accomplishments this year and also to congratulate Dr. Zisa Delgado Noguera for her award today as Faculty of the Year from Fullerton College. She is pioneering a department that is going through a lot of change in ethnic studies right now and they are leaders on our campus with their curriculum innovation and I also just wanted to say thank you to the board for your support for the delegation that is going to Ghana as well as the study abroad program. Thank you. Okay, we move over to United Faculty President Christy Deep. Thank you, she's not here. And CSCA President Pamela Spence. Good evening, board members, chancellor, and president. Congratulations to the Teachers of the Year nominees and NOCE on your 50th anniversary. Um, that was an exciting presentation. Congrats also to our classified members listed in the board agenda tonight for all their new reclassifications from the March 2023 group. I'm here tonight to speak, um, I'm here tonight for CCA to speak on behalf of our members. I'm here to speak for those who can't or are afraid to speak for themselves. Even though we live in a great country, United States, we still need unions to speak up for those who are not treated right. Even here in 2024, with our contract in place and many board and administrative policies, we need to ensure we are continually update and reevaluate our processes and methods for the good of our district, the staff, which even inevitably helps with student success. Our next CSC union meeting is uh, Wednesday, April 17th, 11.30 to 12.30 on Zoom. We'll have all our executive board reports. The voting window is currently open right now for CSDA Area Director H and CSDA Conference nominees. It started today at 10 a.m. It's open until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, they vote electronically. Also, last but not least, CSC supports faculty in their commitment to academic freedom. That concludes my report tonight. Thank you. We move over to ADFAC President Marlo Smith. Good evening, everyone. Um, I first want to congratulate all the Teachers of the Year nominees, especially Mariam Rizé from NOCE. And hearing all of the positive gains that NOCE has made post-pandemic, um, is uh, nothing short of remarkable and makes me proud to be a small part of, uh, of it. So with regard to ADFAC, we have come to a one-year agreement to extend our health care. Thank you for that. Um, hundreds of members will continue receiving this life-changing and life-saving uh, benefit. We, um, we wish to thank our membership, you, the Board of Trustees, um, the California Federation of Teachers, the California State Legislator, and this district for making this benefit available. Uh, healthcare should be included in our collective bargaining agreement so our members can count on it for years to come and we look forward to discussing this with HR in September when we start negotiations. Uh, speaking of negotiations, our team continues to meet weekly. 
We are closely examining CBAs from districts across the region. Our priorities remain uh, the same, securing job security for our members and increasing pay. Adjunct faculty should have equal pay for equal work with our full-time counterparts. Our district pays much less compared to Cerritos, Coast, Rancho, South County, and the LA Community College District. And many of our surrounding districts have better rehire rights and job security for adjunct faculty. Finally, our union is in the middle of elections for our executive board. Members will be emailed a virtual ballot on the 16th and have one week to cast their vote. More information can be found on the front page of our website at vacunited.net. And this concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to our board members. We'll go to Student Trustee Serrano. Thank you. Um, I first wanted to congratulate Professor Zizabel Gado Magura. Um, she, I took multiple classes from her, but my first class from her was my first semester at Fullerton College, um, and I was newly elected president. And since then, she has been such an amazing mentor and just an amazing person overall. Um, I was actually one of the students that wrote a letter of rec for her to be faculty of the year. Um, she's, she's just doing some like transformational work. I've had multiple friends have also taken her classes and I can only ever speak highly about her. She really deserves it. She's also the second ethnic studies faculty in a row after Professor Rosie Carr. Um, so I'm really proud of that uh, given my discipline. Um, I also wanted to mention that this past week was incredibly busy for associated students. I was gone uh, all of last week. I left Monday and then got home this Sunday. Um, so we went to a Apahi, as mentioned, in Oakland. It was really cool. They had really great sessions. Um, one of them was on Isang Pakpak, which is in Tagalog, failure or failed attempt, which was really interesting to me, um, considering, like, having a growth mindset and I've been receiving college decisions. Um, so that was really interesting. And then we also went to General Assembly right after. So we went from Oakland to Santa Clara where we took 10 AS executives. Um, and I'm really happy because I actually got my resolution passed on a state level, which is something I'm super proud of. Um, moreover, AS also has our elections. We have started our orientation for elections this week with campaigning next week. Um, so hopefully you'll meet our new student trustee by May. Um, next, just a little quick update. I received my first college acceptance from UCI. So <laughs> thank you. I'm really excited. Um, I'm still awaiting from like seven, eight institutions. Um, but I hope to continue sharing good news as everyone in this room played a direct or indirect part in my growth as student trustee and just at Fullerton College overall. Overall, I'm just super grateful for the opportunities I've had. It's been a very busy time. Um, but lastly, before I uh, conclude my comments, um, I've been starting my succession, succession plan for the new execs in AS next year. And part of that is a day in my life. So I've been recording my whole day today to give some type of, I guess, just help <laughs> for interested execs and how busy it is to be student trustee. So I have a small request before I leave, if I can just film everyone really quickly, you can wave at the camera so I can include it just so they can see how cool Board of Trustees meetings are. And hopefully we can get way more people to come and go to these amazing <laughs> meetings. Um, but I would really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Can I? <laughs> I was like, everyone's gonna see how busy my day is and how I'm going home at like nine. <laughs> but it's okay, that's part of the job. Okay, so I can start here and then pan over. I wanted, it's like a video throughout the day, unless you, I can also do a panoramic. <laughs> so then I'll just start with the video and then feel free to wave or whatever. Get ready, set, go.
Thank you, everyone. You'll be seeing this on the AS Instagram soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. We move now to Trusty Lopez. No, I can't follow that. <laughs> Trusty Rodarte? Thank you. Trusty Brown. Yeah, just to comment about cybersecurity, we made clear that that's an important uh, um, item for us. and. That we gave direction to the district to um, ramp up what was being done. There are some things that are invisible, some things that are visible, but I got my first fake phishing um, email on my district um, account today, so it's clear that uh, Dr. Lee Bug and the IT people are doing their bit to, uh, you know, to do more visible things that will impact uh, students, staff, faculty, I hope that pays off, but I just wanted to note that you know, there is evidence that things are being done. Thank you. Trustee Dunchy? Again, I just want to thank um, Professor Michael Fay for the really fun eclipse party out in the quad. Trustee Bent? Well, I didn't have a report, but I wanted to say thank you to NOCE for the great presentation earlier this evening. I really enjoyed it. Um, sorry for all the questions we gave you, but it was really good to get clarity. Um, and then since we had the HR team come up and speak, I just want to thank the entire HR team for all the work that you do for us. I know it's a very difficult uh, job, and I just want to say thanks to Vice Chancellor Ramos and Assistant Vice Chancellor Kostek as well, because to me, uh, you know, you're the interface of the board to like our unions and people they negotiate with internally. And I just want to tell you I really appreciate that. I know it's a hard job, and um, I've spoken to a lot of the, our, you know, uh, union leaders as well, and I just let them know that I'm very confident that we get the information from you that they're asking for, and that you're interpreting back what we're asking for to them, and I uh, just want to let you know that we really uh, just know that you're really being respectful in the whole process with uh, as much as you can be on all sides, and I, I just want to let you know I really appreciate that. So thank you so much for all coming up, up and speaking today. That was great, and um, let's have it a good couple weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I want to also congratulate NOC for 50 years and for all the hard work that you're doing and um, really making us really shine uh, in the community. So thank you for that and all the amazing teachers and, and the staff and just the hard work that goes behind in every campus. But today we're highlighting NOCE, so thank you for that and congratulations. Um, and I also want to congratulate all the teachers that were nominated this year. So good, you know, congratulations. And again, thank you for all your hard work. I know it's also something that's um, not easy and faculty work, you know, around the clock a lot of times. So I get that. I, I am faculty as well. So anyways, congratulations. And that really does conclude my report. Thank you. Um, so... Are there any additional comments on non-agenda items? Okay, perfect. So we will now move to closed session. Thank you. Huh? There will be a readout tonight from closed session. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs>